sorry, it's six o'clock. <laughs> um, and I call this regularly scheduled Dunwoody council meeting, city council meeting to order. Um, council, Councilman Lautenbacher, you have the invocation and the pledge please for us today. Thank you, Mayor. At this meeting, Oops. help us to make decisions which keep us faithful to our mission and reflect our values. Give us strength to hold to our purpose, wisdom to guide us, and a keen perception to lead us. And above all, keep us charitable as we deliberate. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chief Grogan. Good evening, Mary Council. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to one of our newest officers, Abubakar Savage. Come on up. Right there. Uh, Abu joined us from the DeKalb County Police Department, where he was employed as a police officer since uh, 2019. He previously worked in corrections with the Juvenile Justice Commission in New Jersey. He has a uh, undergraduate degree, a bachelor degree in criminal justice from Keene University, and a Master of Science degree in Criminal Justice from New Jersey City University. We're excited to have him on our team. And uh, we uh, got to bowl yesterday in a charity bowling tournament. Then when the police department had a team. And so he's one of our uh, bowlers. We didn't quite win the trophy, but, but we tried. Anyways, we're happy to have him on our team. Yeah. 
Officer Savage, we are so grateful that you have chosen our community um, to be your home and we hope we really will become your home and this is we're part of your family now and our community is uh, eager to show you how they support our Dunwoody Police Department so once again thank you so much congratulations next is public comments um I have cards here I'm oh, about to have another one it looks like um, Michael Healy, if you'll just approach the microphone and you'll have three minutes, uh, just introduce yourself if you'd like and three minutes, please. Hi, my name is Michael Healy. I live in a uh, Kingsley subdivision. Uh, I'm commenting on, uh, hunting in bow, especially bow hunting in, in Dunwoody. I just don't feel that li living in a, a neighborhood that has elementary schools and with bow hunting allowed during the day. Uh, it's just unsafe for uh, for children and people walking dogs, people out exercising. Uh, you know, if you shoot an animal and it goes and it starts uh, running away from you, you're there's a chance that that animal can end up hurting somebody rather than just the bow. I'm just saying it's kind of archaic in, in this time of day that we actually have to have some sort of laws against, you know, bow hunting in 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 uh in a municipality that is so close to Atlanta. Uh, I just, I understand what state law says. I understand what the, the county law says. Uh, you know, I just, I hope no one has to go through or uh, the pain of seeing an animal die and suffer in their front yard because somebody shot it with a bow and now it's uh, dead. And now, you know, have to burden our new officer with a, uh, with a, with having the police come out and take care of this. Uh, either yeah, if Dunwee has a game warden or something to take care of, some division of that, that might be a, an, an option. But uh, I just, I really wish that a law could be changed, this law could be changed. And if I could use any help, uh, or if you guys need any, any help, I'll do as much research as I can to get this, this changed. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Hirsch. Hi, I'll try and go through several topics as quickly as I can. Uh, for those of you that did not attend uh, our Barry Dunn consultants for the police department last week, uh, Councilman Hannigan was able to show up for some of it, but um, there were 10 people from the city who showed up. And my biggest takeaway is that the consultants, which are supposed to be making recommendations for the city, do not care why more than 30 officers have less that left the department in the last two and a half years. The, Consultants say they do not care why 30 officers have left. They're not going to read any exit interviews. They're not going to talk to any police officers. They're not going to make any personnel decisions. They don't care that it costs about $50,000 per new hire to train them. Just thought you should know what, what kind of garbage you're going to be getting after you spend $115,000 on this. Next topic. Um, last week, I meant, uh, last two weeks ago, I mentioned that Ginger LePage and Sharon Lowry should perhaps be criminally charged for lying to me and violating the Open Records Act request. I found it interesting that our city manager, who himself is a uh, big violator of the Open Records Act, did not reach out or express any interest to find out what they did or find out any details. And it was also disappointing and noteworthy that uh, Councilman Lautenbacher, when she rewrote our new mission statement, our city no longer says that we are transparent. That was dropped from our trans from our uh, mission statement. Bad timing. Next topic. Uh, coming up in a few minutes, you'll be hearing from code enforcement, Shane Peoples, um, discussing our priorities and what we do and do not enforce in this city. And as I tell you any day, I can go out and find 100 sign code violations in one day. Just, I will do it if anyone wants me to, but they don't ask. And they don't do it because... Shane doesn't even return messages, return phone calls. He doesn't respond to people. I thought we were complaint-driven code enforcement, but we're not because Shane doesn't reply. It's also interesting to note that, you know, everyone has seen on Mount Vernon the, uh, the new Chipotle coming and exciting, but there's been a huge banner there for six weeks that says now hiring, strung between two trees. Everyone knows that's 100% illegal. Code enforcement drives by it every single day but they don't bother to take five minutes to get out of their car and do anything about it. There's a church that has uh, 
are now in rolling sign up with a permit sticker that's supposed to last two weeks. Big on uh, Shambly Dunwoody. They drive by it every day. It's been up there for 12 weeks. Not a priority. It looks like it's selective enforcement. Of noteworthy, when y'all rewrote the sign code with another, it says anything that is draws the attention and directed to be viewed from an outdoor space. That will include all holiday displays, whether it's Rudolph, Frosty. I made a complaint about some Halloween decorations. No one from the city replied to me. Just so you know, if there's more than four signs in a neighborhood, it's a violation, uh, per Thank house, you, it's Turner. a violation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie Weiser. Hi, as you heard, I'm Julie Weiser, and later tonight you will be voting on the American Rescue Plan grant. Um, we, the members of Temple Emmanuel Synagogue, have applied for this grant. Um, we use this grant to serve. We are participating in Metro Atlanta's Backpack Buddy program. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Backpack Buddies of Metro Atlanta, it provides food for insecure children, ins food insecure families and children. We serve three schools in DeKalb County. We serve um, students at Chestnut Elementary, Peachtree Middle, and Hightower Elementary. So this grant provides us with enabling to serve more children. It is our mission in our synagogue um, to serve every child and anybody here in our community, right in our backyard. The food is backpacked um, by our volunteers in our synagogue each weekend and delivered to the elementary schools. These children have been identified by their guidance counselor. Um, our food provides them with both breakfast and lunch for Saturday and Sunday morning. It's a nutritionally dense meal, um, but yet it's kid friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob Dalla. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, with me is Mickey Robinson. I just want to say that uh, we're here from the uh, Coward Astronomy YMCA, and uh, Mickey serves as the executive director. And I've been on the board now for, I think, over 10 years. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I can't count that loud, large. Um, I just want to say thank you for considering uh, our grant request under the ARP and just say we really appreciate that. Thank you. That's two and one. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, that completes public comment for this section of the meeting. We'll have a second section of public comment at the end of the meeting. If anyone has anything else to say, um, we welcome you. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to add a, an additional period of city council comment prior to uh, the reports and presentations. Second. Um, any any, any discussion about this motion? See, uh, John, or questions? I'm just unsure of what it is. A city council comment on what is it? I'm, I'm unsure of the what it is. I I'm not sure what I'm voting on besides. So in essence, we, we have a city council comment period at the end of the meeting. Okay. But, but as we all know, There's no usually it's just us left in the meeting. Got it. So you want so to make some comments, comments that I want to make it. sure at least at least there are a few people in the room to hear. <laughs> that makes more sense to me. Thank you for the explanation. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor of amending the am agenda, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Um, go ahead. Uh, well, so I'll just go down the road and I'll start with Tom since it was his motion. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Council, for accommodating my request. Um, there's been a lot of public discussion over the past several months about trails. The ability to discuss and deliberate public projects and policy is a cornerstone of our republic and something I both respect and embrace. Having an open mind and being willing to not only listen to, but genuinely value and accept opinions that may differ from your own is how we all learn and grow, and it helps me to be a more effective leader in my service to this city. But author Robert Brass stated that healthy debate occurs when people can agree that they have differences of opinions, not differences in facts. And that is really what I want to address tonight. There's been a growing level of misinformation being presented to the public, and this is concerning to me. Opinion is at times being represented as truth, 
and in some extreme cases, reality is being exaggerated or even misrepresented. To have a fair and productive community discussion, it is critical to establish a common baseline of facts. To be clear, I'm not going to go down a bullet point list of statements, misrepresentations, or misinformation. I don't believe that this is the appropriate forum to do that, and I also don't think it would be fair and productive to call out individuals or groups of that without giving them the opportunity to respond. Instead, I'll focus on some of the overarching sentiment that I believe has driven much of the public conversation to this point and needs to be clarified. So let me begin, begin with some of the most basic and common questions and statements we have heard, such as why are we even building trails in the first place, or the blanket statement that nobody wants these trails. To get clarity on these points of view, we need to look no further than Dunwoody's master plans. What are these plans? The Atlanta Regional Commission effectively summarized comprehensive plans as follows. Great places don't happen by accident. Local governments must plan carefully and work with residents to identify a vision for their community and develop a framework to guide future development. The Georgia Planning Act requires that cities and counties maintain comprehensive plans that help shape the future growth. These plans generally recognize the physical, economic, social, political, and aesthetic factions, factors of a community and are developed in a process that includes intensive analysis and robust public engagement. A comprehensive plan typically includes a long range scope and provides the overall guiding principles for a community's growth and development. Some of these plans were created quite deliberately with the process to complete individual plans ranging anywhere from nine months to two years. Most importantly, a multifaceted approach to public engagement was employed, ranging from sounding boards to committees, to public surveys, to one-on-one -on -one interviews, to public meetings, to open houses, all capped off with multiple reads at our city council meeting before formally being adopted. I believe it would be an, it would be an irresponsible waste of time, talent, and resources invested into developing these plans to simply leave them sitting on a figurative shelf. And it would be an enormous disservice to all of our residents, especially those that participated in these planning processes if we chose to ignore their input. In my opinion, planning for the sake of planning or to simply check a box to say we have a plan is pretty worthless. The true value of a plan is not in its creation, but in its execution. I think Thomas Edison said it best when he stated, having a vision for what you want is not enough. Vision without execution is hallucination. Well, I have no delusions. I have read our city's master plans and one consistent message resonates clearly through them all, the desire and the need for trails. It really doesn't matter which plan you choose, the comprehensive plan, the transportation plan, the parks master plan, the Dunwoody village plan, the Georgetown plan, the urban redevelopment plan, the sustainability plan, heck, even the arts and culture master plan, all will promote the strong community desire for trails throughout the city and the recommendation that the city prioritize building a connected trail network. And by the way, all of these plans are available for review at any time on the city website. Simply click on the government tab and then select master plans. For example, Dunwoody's Park and Recreation Master Plan identifies there is a need for more connections with pathways and trailways and indicated on the priority list of recommendations to con continue to develop pathways, sidewalks, bikeways, and expand to connect neighborhoods and parks. On a particular survey question that asked what should be a top priority for future investment, pathways and trails received the highest number of responses. The city's transportation plan indicates that the strong desire to create a community-wide pedestrian bicycle network. One of the community survey questions asked which bicycling and walking investments would you like to see in Dunwoody? The top boat getter was multi-use trails with a 75% response rate. Another question specifically asked which pedestrian facility type would you support to be constructed on main roads? Wide side paths and trails was by far the top boat getter outscoring sidewalks by more than a two to one margin. I believe the master transportation plan also helps answer the public works department, why the public works department is working on these specific trails that we have now. One survey question asked to rate the five new bike pedestrian uh, projects from most important to least important. By far the highest rated was the Tilly Mill multi-use trail from Womack to Mount Vernon with 89% of respondents ranking it in the top as the top or second rated project. Ranking second with 58% of respondents ranking it either one or two was the Peeler Road multi-use trail from Winters Chapel to North Peachtree. And just for the record, 
Nowhere in the master transportation plan does it indicate a recommendation for the Tiller Mill Trail to go on any particular side of the road. And Dunwoody's comprehensive plan, the primary vision shaping document for Dunwoody's next 20 years, stated that input received in the 2020 plan update process revealed a clear desire to continue enhancing and upgrading the city's bike pedestrian network. It states that the city's right of way are assets to maintain and improve, and that many of the city's right of ways also lack complete sidewalks or bike facilities. And though the city has made ongoing improvements, more needs to be done to help ensure greater transportation safety. One of the stated goals of the transportation plan is expand the city's trail network by constructing new trails and greenways with the goal of creating a community-wide pedestrian bike path network. Speaking of plans, you may have noticed one master plan I did not mention, and that is a plan specifically for trails. I hope most people know that plan is currently being developed for Dunwoody by the PATH Foundation. Some question why we are even develop, developing a master trail plan, but to me, the more appropriate question is why has it taken us so long to create a master trail plan? When something is consistently ranked among the top requested amenities by your residents, and, and when it appears as an identified goal or priority in every city plan, well, I believe we have a responsibility to make that a reality. But simply calling something a priority doesn't make it such. We need to have a clearly defined vision and a plan to implement it. And I'm hopeful that this process will more clearly define our residents' desires and expectations when it comes to trails. Create a clear vision for a citywide trail network, alleviate common but unwarranted concerns regarding trails, answer any lingering questions the public may have, and provide us a strategy for implementation. Another comment I have heard stated by several people is that nobody from the city is listening to us or nobody from city council has responded to me. I take personal exception to these comments because I have gone above the call of duty to ensure everyone has been heard. Regarding these specific trail projects, I have personally responded to every email and phone call I have received. I have offered to make myself available to anyone that wanted to meet with me. I have met with groups of people and individuals. I have met on site in the neighborhoods. I have walked the proposed trail location with concerned residents. I have walked through people's front yards, through their backyards, and even portions of the woods. I've met multiple times in coffee houses. I've stood in residents' kitchens and even sat on one resident's deck for a personal meeting that lasted over two and a half hours. To ensure that all questions and concerns were addressed, I even set up three separate meetings with myself and city staff at City Hall for the neighborhoods that had reached out to me with concerns. One for Holland Court, one for Stevens Walk, and one combined for Briars North and Madison. Every resident living in those neighborhoods received an invitation to the meeting, mailed to them via the United States Postal Service. The meetings were very well attended and lasted anywhere from an hour and 40 minutes to two hours each. I took notes at each meeting and shared those notes with the mayor, city council, and appropriate city staff to ensure that everyone was fully informed of the residents' concerns. With the hopes of mitigating some of the concerns I heard from residents, I personally created an alternate plan for the Womack Mount Vernon Tilly Mill project, which I share with our public works team. That idea has now been formally reviewed and prepared as a new conceptual design for the project. And meetings have already been scheduled to review this new concept with Holland Court and Stevens Walk to get their feedback. The state that no one from the city is listening or has ever applied to them is simply not true. A somewhat related complaint is that the current city council has some secret agenda has already made up its mind and is trying to sneak these projects through without public input. First of all, as discussed a little earlier, these projects come directly from Dunwoody's master transportation plan, which is adopted by city council in 2017. I've already discussed my personal efforts to listen to and address concerns raised by individuals and groups of residents, and that process remains ongoing. But let's take a step back to address where we are in the planning process for these projects. If you visit a project page on the city website, there's a project timeline on the top of the page that indicates seven basic stages of the project life cycle so that community can keep track of progress. Each of the projects we are discussing is currently in the first stage or the concept phase, where an idea is presented for public discussion and feedback. I think it is fair to say that is exactly what is happening. We are so early in the process that we still have two design phases yet to go one for preliminary design and one for final design. 
Another sentiment I've heard rather frequently lately is people telling me that you are my representative on council and you need to do what I want. Well, this creates a bit of a paradox or impossible situation because how can I represent the interests of every individual when individual interests rarely, if ever, agree? Yes, I believe I have an obligation in my role as a city council member to listen to everyone's opinion and concerns and genuinely look for ways to help. But I can assure you that I have received significant feedback from residents in full support of these trail projects. Should those that oppose something be granted the power of veto? The growing sentiment in our society that you're either with me or against me is counterproductive and dangerous. It is my opinion that the best solution to any situation rarely resides at the extremes, but I'd say somewhere in between if you have an open mind and are willing to look for it. Effective communication is the key here. When people think of communication, I believe most people think of speaking, but the other component of communication is listening. And I would argue that truly hearing what someone else has to say is the most important part of the communication process. So rather than simply dismissing a project, I prefer to drill down onto the specific reasons for opposition. Often, but certainly not always, there are solutions to address and mitigate those concerns. And the final solution may not be perfect, but that is okay, because I believe perfect is often the enemy of progress. Eventually the planning has to stop and decisions have to be made. I wanna clearly reiterate that I'm not trying to discount or dismiss anyone's opinion. I fully support and encourage the opportunity for the public to voice and express their concerns. I genuinely welcome all opinions with an open mind and truly believe that the more our residents are engaged in the process, the better we all are as a city. But we navigate a difficult role when the, road, when the decision devolves into campaigns of unsubstantiated conspiracy theories and false information. The object of this debate shouldn't be, the, I'm sorry, the objective of this debate shouldn't be to win but to arrive at the solution that best serves our city. That remains my goal. And as always, I'm readily available to anyone that would like to engage in an open-minded dialogue on any city issue. Thank you. All right, we'll have council comment, I think at the end as well, but does anybody have anything, Catherine? Stacy? I just wanna say thank you to Tom for the inordinate amount of time that he has spent on this. Um, and not only meeting with all the residents and answering all the questions, um, but really being the lead person on this. And I appreciate your words tonight. Um, I have been the subject of innuendo and conspiracy theories as well. Um, so I appreciate you setting the record straight that we strive to be as transparent as possible um, and listen to as many citizens as we can. And thank you, Tom. Joe. Um, again, I, I want to I say, you know, being on council is like being in an arranged marriage with six other people. So everybody provides different things that it comes to the table with and uh, provides different time and resources. And I appreciate the work that Tom's putting in, that Rob's, Catherine, Lynn, Stacy, John, everybody here bringing to the table different different things to, to the plate um, moving forward. So we are moving forward. Uh, and I appreciate about execution. We're going to be moving forward with implementing our plans. Thank you. John. Yeah, no comment. I'm okay. good. Thank you. Appreciate everybody else's comments though. Thank you. Um, since I have the opportunity about deer hunting so that you don't have to stay till the end for council comments if you don't want. So we are aware of the problem. We have discussed it previously. Um, we have a new attorney and we're going to ask him to see what options we may have. The city of Sandy Springs at their council meeting a few days ago began had the same discussion that we've all had over and over again. And we have our legislative uh, support team here too. And so we understand, let me say, I understand the problem. I think council understands the problem. Um, we are not ignoring it. Uh, in 2006, the voters of Georgia passed a constitutional amendment that gave hunters more powers than legislation legislature could and so it's a really tricky situation but one that we have not given up on trying to come to some solution so say that thank you all right with that it is time for reports and presentations eric yes ma'am thank you thank you mayor mm -hmm. all right the city manager's report ending november 11th 2022 um i want to start out with uh, the police department we currently had the we had the uh, trunk or treat at Brook Run on October the 27th. We also had the National Prescription Drug Take Back Day on October the 29th. 
if you look through um, the different things, you'll see there's a lot of, uh, you know, Dunwoody is a is a city within the metropolitan area. We have quite a few um, various crimes that the police have solved and are working on, and also amount of activity that goes on within the city. I did also want to address that we um, we will redo the Barry Dunn uh, meeting. It'll be sometime in January from the one from last Tuesday that will be redone there. They've had, there is an online process. We've had about 55 comments on that so far. And, uh, and the study is going very well to date. I believe all the council members, except for one have met with the, um, with the crew that's come in. And so uh, that's what we have th for that. Moving on to the next area, which is public works. The Spalding storm drain upgrade uh, Astra uh, contracting has begun boring for the new storm drain crossing there. So that detour hopefully won't be too much longer. And also the Georgetown Gateway, Georgia Power has removed the old utility poles north of Chateau, Chateau Drive. So the city's contractor can finish the remaining work on this part of the project. The contractor has completed about 90% of the path north of Chateau. Um, Shambly, Dunwoody at Womack intersection. Wilson Construction has completed both retaining walls. Georgia Power has also relocated the overhead power lines. Uh, we continue delays in the area between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. daily during the weekdays and when weather is permitting. Dunwoody Park sidewalk. Uh, we have the new sidewalk to begin between Shamley Dunwoody Road and Dunwoody South, Dunwoody Park South, excuse me. Parks Department, we had um, last Friday at the Veterans uh, celebration. We had Robert Patrick, our DeKalb commissioner, uh, give the city a check for $100,000 to go towards the Veterans Memorial at Brook Run Park. Also, we did have the uh, Georgia Parks and Recreation Association recognize our Parks Department, Brent, Brent Walker and his staff, for our Marketing, Visibility, and, and Publication Award for the Grooving on the Green. So that's brand new information that came out just last week on that. We do have our December 1st holiday lights opening night and January 16th will be the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day of Service. Let's see, we have the uh, site grading for Two Bridges Park is 75% complete. If you haven't had the opportunity to drive by there, please do. You'll see the footer for the bathroom pump room has been poured and the playground equipment installation has begun. The nature trail is about 95% complete. And the parking lot curb and gutter is about 50% complete. So that project is coming on very nicely. Community development. Uh, the work at High Street continues to move swiftly. Framing has occur is occurring on the fifth and sixth levels of the multifamily buildings. Site work for the second uh, phase of Campus 244, which is the parking deck and hotel, has started. The Buffalo Wild Ring Wing Restaurant at Hammond Drive at the corner of the mall is being framed. Mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems are being installed there. Um, the P.F. Chang's, of course, that was kind of next door here, has now moved to the mall, and that's complete. And also the new Quick Trip, which is now kind of next door, is being topped out with mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems are being installed there. Trees Atlanta has planted their first 10 trees in the front yard tree planting program. Just want to let y'all know that that's underway, something that y'all approved and put extra money in to that program. Finance, you'll find within the report, the uh, financial report for September the 22nd, there's a link in there for that. Also municipal court has disposed of 708 cases and 38 cases were reset for last month. And the department has prepared the 2023 municipal court calendar. Also the clerk's office has processed 446 open record requests for the month of October. It's a little bit higher than usual for that month, but there's quite a bit of activity people want to know about within the city. Mayor and Council, I'm glad to answer any questions you may have on this report. We'll start on John's end. No questions. Hey, Eric, uh, thank you. Um, keeping with the theme of the trail master plan, do you mind just mentioning this is kind of last minute since the report was made about our coming upcoming couple of public opportunities to provide some feedback on that sure, scheduled and sure. when and where those will be. Right. So for the path, uh, we, there'll be a booth set up on November the 20th at Light Up Dunwoody. Um, so look out for that. 
and that's something we finalized. We already had it in the works, but we finalized that today. Um, and the activity, everything's confirmed. That, you know, Greta, which is our contact at PATH, will be there. Also on um, December 7th in this room here at 6 p.m. is another meeting uh, to talk about the PATH and the trail system. And then also as a side note, on the 10th of December, we have the Vermac Park uh, meeting as well. I think, Joe, that you're hosting out there. And I think many of the council members will be there at Vermac Park. It'll be on site. Hopefully it won't be 38 degrees, but nonetheless, it will be on that day. So. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, just appreciate because we're trying to outreach to people to provide feedback. And so we're trying to go to where the people are as well. That makes uh, their schedule. So as I could say, so during Light Up Dunwoody, just show up there, drop by, provide feedback. A guy asked me today, where's the plan I could provide feedback on? I said, you get to provide the feedback of what the plan will be, right? So you're at the initial stages of that. So that's great. Um, update on the uh, check washing at the post office is why I noted that on the police activities. Do we have any other update on that investigation? Yes. So, I mean, and the chief may want to come up and, and address that. I know he's been working very diligently with a post uh, master on that issue because that's become a very large concern for many residents of Dunwoody. Anybody who uses that post office, chief? Sure. Our investigators are working very closely with the postal inspector who actually uh, investigates external thefts, but also the uh, the inspector general's office who uh, actually does the internal thefts. So it's two different uh, because some of these appear like they could be external thefts, but others appear to be maybe internal theft by employees. And so it's happening at multiple places. Uh, sometimes when people have mailed uh, things from their own own mailbox and it's picked up by the post uh, the postal person and uh, other times when they've dropped them off at a box, whether it's in the village, whether it's at Walmart or whether it's over at Independence Square, different places. So we are working very closely with the postal inspector. When you say the postal inspector, is that somebody high level or is it the Dunwoody one? Like, where no, are no, we in the, that's, that's the urgency? State. Okay. That's the state. They, uh, they, they have responsibility for investigating crime that's happening at the post office. It's a federal agency. Do we feel like it's getting the proper attention from the, okay. Uh, well, uh, we, we had a, actually a meeting that was pretty productive a couple of weeks ago. And uh, every time we have a new case, we're sending that to them and, again, stressing the importance of this. So, yeah. Um, last thing for Eric, more of a comment, but um, uh, thank you to the staff for uh, Brent Walker, Michael Smith. Chief, don't go very far. Chief, oh, you might have another question, Chief. Uh, but um, out on, in front of the Brook Run uh, Park there on North Peach Tree, uh, where, where um, Peeler is, you know, just created a little extra, you know, 20-foot segment of sidewalk there. Um, cause it was a little goat path there, whatever call it through this, through the grass. And I was like, Hey, let's just do it where people are naturally walking. And you guys, guys did that. So again, just that incrementalism of supporting a, a safer place to, to walk or ride bikes in the city. It's a little bit, but it does help. Thank you. Um, chief, my question to you was, um, the sex trafficking talk that you, that was held on the 10th, how well attended was it? And, and what do you think the reception was? I'm sorry, which talk? The panel discussion on the sex trafficking. Oh, it was, uh, you know, it was a rainy night, I think, and a school night, but uh, it was well attended. I think there were about 50 to 60 people there. And uh, so it was a good discussion. I think. And then my next question, I don't know whether it's to you or Michael Smith, but that Shamley, definitely the Spalding detour that I know we have police officers helping direct traffic. Now I got stuck in it this past week. How is that working and how do we feel like the detours going better like are they <laughs> michael smith probably could answer that better uh, you, you got stuck in it when there was an officer out there or yeah so we we put an officer out there for morning rush hour and afternoon like two hours in the morning two hours in the afternoon to help the traffic flow during those times um, other parts of the day, it is backing up a little bit, but it was worse during those times. So we're, we're doing that and just trying to get the road open as soon as we can. 
Catherine, thank you. I'll just comment on that from a, a from a resident who stated that it isn't better with the police officer there in terms of there is a backup, but it is it, um, it's more understandable. So there's a lot the simmers you know mm -hmm. tones down the the angry response, yeah, frustration. Yes, so uh, the police officer is appreciated out there. Thank you, Rob. Just a quick question. Um, where do we stand on the staffing for the police department? Are we, we, we sworn a new officer today? Where, how many openings do we have? Chief's coming up. So I think currently we have either, I can't remember, five or six openings. Um, and we have, um, I'm interviewing someone uh, Thursday. Uh, for an interview to do a poten potential conditional job offer. We have two others already in background. We tested someone today who passed, so they'll be in background. That's a sworn position. And we had three other applications of sworn officers. So we have about six or seven candidates in background right now at various stages uh, that have applied. And we're hopeful that uh, we can be at full staff in the not too distant future. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Uh, Tom, anything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Next up, Shane Peoples. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with me and our code enforcement team, my name is Shane Peoples, and with the help of Inspector Valerie Hicks and Sharon Helm, we have the pleasure of conducting the city's code enforcement operations throughout the city. Uh, I'll only take up a few minutes of, of y'all's time uh, tonight just to briefly go over some of our special projects and, and our code enforcement process. So. Uh, currently. We, so I think historically Dunwoody has only had two code enforcement officers and you guys were gracious enough to prove us a third, uh, which we appreciate that. Um, but with that, what we've done is we've been able to divide the city into three different districts. Uh, and each of the officers as my, and myself were able to be assigned a district. We work with GIS to get these district maps and down at the bottom there, uh, you'll see our um, assigned districts. I also handle the um, commercial areas uh, like Georgetown and the village and over near the mall area as well. We're still there to back each other up if if complaints are rolling in steady uh, in a respective officer's district. But one thing this has allowed us to do is to stick an inspector in these specific districts and uh, that allows the inspector um, to become familiar with that district and for the citizens to become familiar with that inspector as well. And they can also uh, be familiar with a lot of the challenges uh, within within that district. So, um, so I, I wanna go over our code enforcement process here um, and there's about five aspects of it, which is education, uh, the initial complaint, notice of violation, citation, and then the abatement. We are, I do want to say we are a complaint driven, um, we want complaint driven enforcement. Um, so if, if anything's called in, we, we inspect it and and if there's violations found, then we'll move forward in the enforcement. But the education for our, our website here, uh, and I put a picture here, is a great resource for the citizens as well as staff uh, to research our code and some of the more um, frequent things that we tend to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you can also file compl online complaints there through our uh, iWork portal, which when citizens use that portal, um, it's one of the, I'm more fond of that method there. When citizens use that method, that email goes directly to the inspector immediately. So if they're in the car in the district, uh, they get that complaint and can get it immediately. Uh, we also have our complaint line uh, as well as our 
complaint uh, email address as well. And all that information can be found <clears throat> on the city website under the code enforcement tab. Our information is there as well, our phone numbers and our email addresses. So some of the complaint type we do, complaint types we typically see, we have officer observed complaints, uh, online complaints, our compliance line, uh, email, and then we also get internal complaints from city staff, such as public works or, or any other of our departments as well that we investigate. Uh, so if we're called out and there is a violation present after our inspection, um, you know, seeing that it's not life safety, uh, our first enforcement action is a notice of violation. And I put a picture of our actual, this is our actual form that our notice of violation that we would send out to an address um, because a lot of the times citizens will get this and they'll say, oh, I've been cited, you know, what's going on? And it's, it's not a citation, it's just a code enforcement notice of violation. And it's the initial step in the a response to the violation. Uh, it, it identifies uh, what's going on on the property. And we also provide uh, a reasonable time to correct the violations, typically five days, but sometimes they're extenuating circumstances uh, that we may have to go to 10 days or so. So, But I, I just want to stress this. It's not a citation. This is our notice of violation. We also use door hangers as well. So. Uh, and then after that has failed or we haven't been able to achieve compliance through the notice of violation, um, then we'll move to a citation. And this is also a picture for citation. Um, typically we try to issue these on site to people, but sometimes there are circumstances to where uh, we aren't able to issue them uh, to the property owners. Uh, so we'll have to search, you know, search through the Secretary of State's website or DeCab tax assessors get the best information we can and we'll send it certified mail as well. But uh, this is a summons issued uh, after the education element has failed um, and generally given a court date and to come in to speak with the solicitor to see if we can't get the case adjudicated that way. Uh, just to kind of change, change modes here, uh, we have a few special projects. That's not all of them. We've got more. Um, but some of the more important ones are apartment sweeps, uh, prohibited signs, uh, commercial property sweeps, and our short-term short rental enforcement. I'll start with your property um, multifamily sweeps. We do these inspections, and they're done on our apartment units here in the city. And we only uh, notate the exterior violations. Um, and we, after that report, myself, Valerie, and Sharon, uh, we all divide those buildings up and go through uh, the uh, exterior of those buildings and notate all the violations on a shared report. That report is then given to the property management company to get those violations into compliance uh, within 30 days or less. We do allow for, you know, there's a lot of cases, some of our larger units, you know, 30 days is not enough and they'll ask for an extension and, and that is reviewed. But I would say out of all of our special projects, this is the most important uh, because a lot of the citizens don't even know that this is an option or that we even do this. So it allows us to kind of give them a voice um, to get some of those violations into compliance. Just a few pictures. This was done when I first arrived here in 2021 uh, and um, these are some of the violations that we typically see, graffiti, you know, outside storage, unsecured buildings, um, and motorcycles. And, and this is just the beginning of, of what we can see on some of those, some of those sweeps. Our, our prohibited sign enforcement, we, a lot of our sign enforcement is signs in the right of way um, during election season and things like that. But we also take care of things of properties that have moved in or, or moved out, I should say, um, vacant signs. Those are the things that we try to get removed as well. Uh, our vacant properties uh, program, this is something where the third officer has helped. Sharon's done a great job with this program. Uh, we maintain a vacant properties list and she inspects those properties once a month for open doors, violations as you know, uh, high weeds and grass, 
anything like that. We, we try to get the best information as far as the property owners so that we can reach out to them. Um, if we do find violations, it's it's challenging sometimes, but you know, we try to maintain a, a updated list of that. Um, but as soon as those properties are purchased, uh, we take those off the list uh, as long as they're being maintained. And these inspections are really critical as well because the blight, uh, we all know the problems that that can, can bring to a community. Uh, finally, our short-term rental enforcement's kind of kind of started just doing it now. I'm still trying to work out the kinks of it um, and the challenges of it, but uh, properties uh, or units are identified via citizen complaints, uh, or we've also started, well, myself actually just started combing a lot of the websites that are out there to find uh, the short-term rentals that we have here in the city. Uh, and once those properties are identified, we will send out the notice of violation to the owner, letting them know what our policy here in the city is, and that uh, those listings will have to be changed to reflect what our ordinance here in the city is. Um, it's challenging, I will say more so challenging with the multifamily units, um, but I, I will tell you, we've gotten buy-in from the property management companies helping us out. Uh, they don't want it happening there. It's not good for their business model. Uh, and so when they can identify a unit, they've helped me out by passing on my information to, or they've got, and I found a lot that they've had their own process going on where they've even threatened to evict people as well. But I would say the most success I've seen is the single family residents. I've issued those notices to those property owners or homeowners, and they've been very compliant and say, hey, we just want to be uh, in compliance with what the city wants us to do. So. Um, like I said, we're working closely with the leasing offices and the multifamily properties um, to get that done. And I know a lot of municipalities, uh, the code enforcement, they're using softwares to identify them, which makes it a little easy. It's not always the best because I've used it in a previous municipality, but it does help. Um, but, you know, I think as long as we're, if we can get the education out there, which I know we're working with communications to do, I think we'll start seeing seeing a turnaround in that. So, by the way, okay. Questions, discussion, starting with Tom. Uh, yeah, thank you, Shane. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think that was important for the public to hear. I, I, you have a very uh, sometimes underappreciated and misunderstood job, uh, and, but we do appreciate everything you and your team do uh, for the city. Um, and I, I think it's great for that the, the community got to learn a little bit more about that as well. Uh, I, I just have one question for you. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, in the presentation that uh, the fact that we did add a, an additional code enforcement officer for, uh, for this year. Can you speak a little bit to how that has uh, impacted impacted your team's ability to to do your job to be more reactive and perhaps even pro proactive in, in situations oh for sure i mean it's allowed us to have another car out there on the street another set of eyes um to pick up on violations and like i said as far as the apartment sweep goes uh, some of these larger apartment complexes are the ones with the most problems it, we're, we're able to more effectively inspect those buildings uh, versus having two you know, officers out there trying to inspect a two, 300 unit apartment complex, so. Okay, whoops, okay, <laughs> thank you. That's all I have. And I, I always appreciate the responsiveness no, of you and your team. No I'll echo the thanks and uh, I'll ask a question you don't need to answer right now, but I would just say you and your staff, when you're working, if you're getting complaints about issues that are not well covered by our ordinances, I just hope you'll share that with us. So if we need to tweak okay. something so that, you know, cause you're kind of the front line of interaction with the public. And so I would rather us try to fix problems, you know, that you all see or that you, as you get feedback from citizens early on, rather than, you know, people complaining, no one ever, nothing ever gets done about something uh, when we can make some sort of fix. So no just, just a request for the future. Yeah, Thank you. Do that. No problem. Do you have a plan or schedule for apartment sweeps? Is that a yearly? It's no, we don't process? we don't typically have a forecast form. We normally just during while we're riding out, I ask the inspectors if you're in a area where you're getting 
high volume of calls. Let's take a look at that one and see if we might need to sweep it um, for for the year. But we can that's something we can definitely look at doing. It might be valuable. Then nothing yeah. is missed, and then right. those residents have exactly what you want this this care that they uh, they don't even know that they right. they need. So, just a suggestion. Thank you, yeah. Stacy. Um, I just kind of had a question. When we talk about the complaints and coming in, is it multifamily? Is it single residential? Is it neighbor versus neighbor? Is a person walking down the sidewalk? Like, what's the? Is there a commonality? I'm just curious as to because we are complaint driven. Like, what what do you find your focus to be, and 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 where? I would say the majority of the complaints is neighbor versus neighbor. <laughs> Joe, anything? Hey, Shane. Um, thank you for everything you do. Um, you guys do a ride along like the police do? That would be a question for Eric or Richard. Maybe. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. It might be interesting. Um, I've been like, asked that before, though. It's not that from, idea. From the citizens, hey. so. Um, so I'm a big uh, like analysis reporting data guy as well. So I got a couple of related questions. Um, perfect world. I'd love to see combined a C click fix and iWorks to submit issues. Yeah, whether it's, I know we there's only so much we can do internally on staff to, to IT systems and we have to watch the scope and all sorts of things. But have you had a little bit of conversations of discussions about potentially going to a common uh, platform? No, I'd love to. I'd love to. I have not had it, but I'd love to go to a common, yeah. I mean, right. we, we get we get a few from Public Works through C Quick, Quick Fix, and it's a great tool. That's all I was saying in the presentation. I, I would love it. It works. It's more efficient for us to get them through iWork because we get them immediately, um, and they're not coming from five different places. But that would be a wonderful conversation to have. Yeah, um, I definitely um, would like to see that eventually. Maybe we put that on our uh, our budgeting for future uh, to, to get to that single place. It's greater for the citizens. Um, and and laying on top of that reporting, do you have, a, are you able to have a, a dashboard of metrics of what, like by type, by case, by we open, do. close status and so we on? Do. We do. We have that with iWork and they've even added some new features here recently, the last right. couple of months. So potentially we could add that to our monthly city manager report potentially to see a status of what's open closed just by type don't need a low level you know don't yeah. don't get the address or so on but yeah. um, i definitely support what Catherine said about making sure that they're scheduled for the multifamily. absolutely right. to do that um surprise notice um and then um just a scheduling wise weekends are, are you guys working on the weekends we are it's sporadic now so want to work weekend I, I try myself to work at least one weekend a month um, but it's something I'm talking to with the inspectors, just to at least get out there and have a presence out there so people will see us driving through and know that we are doing some. Right. There's, you know, we have activity going on right. on the weekends, of course, um, that so on and so forth. And then uh, just to let people know more of a comment than a question, but when you do, when a citizen submits a, a ticket, et cetera, they realize that they're going to be open, uh, subject to open records yes. that they would be identified, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. John. Thank you, Shane. You guys do a wonderful job. Thank you. I appreciate the efforts. I appreciate the, the, the work being put forward. Tell me about the sign sweeps in the sense of signs along the side of the road in the right of way. In the right of way, they're immediately in violation. Right. How quick are we picking these things up? So we're trying to, I myself do a sweep. I'll do one tomorrow. Um, we try to do them for each officer. I tell them to sweep their area at least once a week. I definitely try to do it on the weekend because what I've noticed the last couple of weeks is they they more, especially in our hotspot areas, start showing up around Thursday to Friday. Garage um, sales, right? <laughs> garage sales and then out, out on the far end to town over there off of 285 off a of cotillion there. Um, so Mondays too, Monday morning, because I know they, on the weekends, they come in. So. Yeah, please, the uh, exit ramps. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um as far as the violations, one of the things that I'm notified of all the time is sanitation is overflowing, garbage cans overflowing at multifamily units. What's our jurisdiction and what's our fix? If you see the sanitation, you know, a lot of garbage outside the cans, yeah. 
So what what's we our fix? How do we do that? Well, we immediately go through with uh, our first point is to notify them, give them notice of violation. We'll give them five or so days. Recently, I guess at the beginning of the year, people were complaining of sanitation, uh, labor problems, and we were sy sympathetic to that until a point, and then we have to issue citations for them to come into court. We had a multifamily unit that that happened to, they ended up um, enlarging the dumpster pad and get more dumpsters on site. Uh, and we haven't had any more issues out there uh, at that particular, but our initial step is our code enforcement process with the notice of violation. Um, and then we have to, if we move to have to move to citation, then that's what we'll do. Okay. Um, let's circle back to a couple of people have mentioned, you have a new their staff member, so you have more work. Um, it's not just as it happens, you now have historical information. Tell me about your data system. There's a house maybe that needs a major cleanup. There might be something going on, whether it's, you know, the house is abandoned, whatever the issue is. Do we have to wait six months for it to grow back up? Or are you going to go look at that house? Since it was a known issue, you were forced to clean up, you went through and did all the work to find somebody to get that house cleaned up. Yeah. So when if, do you go back? What, I mean, what's your follow up? I mean, you what data do you have? And are you looking at problem areas in order to ensure compliance is ongoing? Or do you, are you waiting for the neighbor next door to make that complaint again? For our vacant properties? Or Vac just, anything, vacant property, uh, long grass, the, yeah. known issues that people have complained about. Right. Are you waiting for us to complain the second time? Or are you looking at your database going, all right, we th cleaned them up six weeks ago. Let's see what they look like you know, today. Yeah, so we do have data in in the way of what we have on iWork. So if we go to a, a resident and we know that we've had number a number of issues there where we've issued notices after notices and maybe even citations, that's going to be a address that we're going to put on our radar to drive by periodically through the month or however to to make sure we can head off any violations continuous violations so we're doing regular inspections on our sort of problem i don't say problem but you know some of our more frequent uh, cases that we get because if you don't have a data system i have people in my neighborhood that i keep really long records yes they yeah. keep really good <laughs> records and they will notify me and you of, oh, yeah. of every time you visited some house right. so i want to make sure that we're proactive in the right. sense that we've given you some staff i'd love to find that that database that you are proactively looking at the problem issues within the city no problem. thank you sir i appreciate no it okay um i just have a couple of I'm sorry, I have a couple of questions. So what is, whose responsibility is like health and safety, like in an apartment complex that has a detention pond that's not well-maintained? It's them, it's the-, uh, the res But is, do, can we cite them for that kind of thing? Yes. Okay. And that's part of, I look at that uh, when we do our inspections, I'm the one that looks at all the detention. Right. So early in the pandemic, Councilman Tallman, she's not here anymore. She got a list of faith-based group that might step in in this uh, situation with single family homeowners who simply could not maintain their own properties. I don't know if we ever made referrals from that list or we still have it. We can replicate it if we need to. But when you come, I don't know how often you come across the situation where the homeowner or the tenant of a single family home, because apartment complexes are a whole different ball of wax, um, simply can't maintain their property yeah, we do and do we share resources with them or we need to update all that for y'all we'll probably we would okay yeah so we, i'll we, get some we'll get that information together yeah right now we just we point towards we send links and give literature out from state programs okay so there should be. anything would help okay and in the case of single family homes when it's neighbor versus neighbor but the neighbor might have a like the grass is now three feet high um what how off is it are we frequently now coming across or have forever and we just didn't know coming across people who simply cannot maintain their property mm -hmm. as opposed to absentee landlords or negligent homeowners yeah, I mean, there's, we've had it all from people that are just elderly yeah okay might not all be right. able to get outside do it uh, to people right. who just can't monetarily well we'll work on trying to develop that resource list again and 
because I think it would be a good local project for scouts or churches, places of worship, community service hours. Lots of high schoolers need, middle schoolers need community service hours. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anybody else have anything? Thank you, Shane. This has been very helpful. Thank you guys. All right. Um, next up is consent. Does anybody have any questions or comments on consent? Move um, to approve. Oh. Move by Tom. Second. Second. And I just want to say thank you to the finance department for doing the sinking fund and being transparent. It's something we can move forward with. Okay. Um, any further questions or comments on this? Nope. Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next up. I think Sharon might have to read this. There's nothing, Jay, by the way. I don't have the resolution right in front of me, Mayor. Okay. One moment. Oh, it's I think it's just the title of the agenda item, but maybe not. Okay. A resolution establishing the 2023 state legislative priorities of the city of Dunwoody for consideration by the Georgia State Legislature during the 2023 regular session. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I have with me tonight Ted Berto and Chris Hopper from Terminus Strategies, who will do at the beginning of this a brief update on uh, the past week's elections review and a preview of the 2023 session, and then we'll move into the resolution afterwards. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, Ted Bordeaux, with my colleague Chris Hopper, and we have a new member of our firm, Theron Johnson, in the back, who's here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, give you a quick overview of the election outcomes and then the kind of uh, anticipated uh, what to come in 2023 session and then answer any questions that you might have. Can you please make sure you're speaking in the microphone? Thank you. Yeah. So good evening, Mayor and Council members. Mm -hmm. My name is Chris Hopper, as Ted said. I'm a partner at Terminus Strategies. I'm here tonight to talk about the 2022 um, midterm election more specifically the voter turnout and the outcomes of the elections. With voter turnout, as you may have already known, the Georgia, Georgians cast in midterm ballots at a record-breaking pace. More than 2.5 million Georgians casted a vote during the three-week early voting period, which for perspective, that surpassed the 1.8 million total in 2018 and almost exceeded the 2020 presidential election of 2.6 million. As for overall turnout in this election, nearly 4 million voters voted, which represents approximately 57% of the total registered voters. Moving to the, out, to the election outcomes, it's worth noting that this is the first election since redistricting. U.S. Senate race between incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock and challenger Herschel Walker will head to the runoff on December 6th after neither one of them obtained 50% plus one votes necessary to avoid the runoff. Less than a percentage point separated the candidates, which is approximately 35,000 votes. Um, that said, the Democrats have retained control in the Senate with at least a 50-50 split. So this Georgia Senate race will still be important and will further determine the margin of control in the U.S. Senate. The U.S. House delegation is now nine Republicans and five Democrats with a GOP plus one result. The delegation room remains the same other than Rich McCormick in the sixth and Mike Collins in the 10th district. As for statewide constitutional officers, Georgia state government holds a trifecta status, meaning that the Republican party holds a governor's office as well as a majority in both chambers of the state legislature. Governor Brian Kemp won re-election against Stacey Abrams by more than seven and a half percentage points and Republicans swept the other state constitutional offices, including a new Lieutenant Governor and Burke Jones and Agriculture Commissioner Tyler Harper Labor Commissioner Bruce Thompson, as well as the other incumbents, Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, Attorney General Chris Carr, Insurance Commissioner John King, and then notably, the reason I went through the whole list, State School Superintendent Richard Woods, who received the most votes on the ballot. Moving to the State House and Senate, the composition of the Georgia State House and Senate remained nearly the same. Republicans lost a net two seats in the House and one seat in the Senate. The state house is comprised of 101 Republicans and 79 Democrats for a 56-44% split. I wanted to note that House District 129, a formerly Democrat-held seat, is still awaiting a special election on December 20th to fill the vacancy for the late Representative Henry Wayne Howard, and it's projected that, that seat's going to go Democrat. The state Senate is now comprised of 33 Republicans and 23 Democrats for a 59-41% split. Um, 
there are many new members in the General Assembly. And Ted is going to talk about next year's, I guess, like the hot topics during session. But we have a lot of new faces. The House has 42 new members, 17 Republican, 25 Democrat. The Senate has 10 new members, six Republican, four Democrat. Speaking of new members, the Dunwoody delegation has a new member as well. While both Senator Sally Harrell and Representative Shea Roberts won re-election, um, new member Long Tran defeated Brian Anderson for House District 80. The last thing I wanted to talk about was caucus elections, caucus leadership elections. Following the elections, caucus leadership races are always just around the corner. The Republican caucus leadership elections occurred last Friday in the Senate and earlier today in the House. Um, the Dem caucus leadership elections will occur in the next coming weeks. Um, in addition to the 42 new members, Speaker David Ralston also announced that he will not seek another term as Speaker. And earlier today, during the caucus election in the House, former Majority Leader John Burns was nominated as the new Speaker as a highlight. So post uh, caucus leadership elections, we kind of have a better understanding of what we're going to anticipate next year for the 2023 um, session. Um, We'll get a even further kind of gleaming down of what the issues uh, leadership are interested in at the biennial, which is the first weekend in December in Athens. It's a legislative training and kind of a welcome initiation for new members of the House and Senate. Uh, this will be the first year of the 2023-2024 biennial. So any legislation introduced this year will stay alive for next year. So we'll have to track that as we go forward for the next two years. Um, and then the kind of major issues that we've heard through the summer and in uh, legislative meetings over the summer and in, during campaign season begin with the budget. Uh, the FY22 surplus reached almost $6 billion. That's after the budget was $28.6 billion in spending. So during the amended FY22, we'll probably see some new money spent there. It'll be interesting to see how the new leadership of both parties looks to um, kind of prioritize that, that extra surplus money. For the FY23 revenue, which started July 1st, um, the last month we saw returns and revenue were, was October. It was a 9.3% increase. That brings our year-to-date total revenue of $10.32 billion, which is up 7.8% year over year. So despite some concerns about economic slowdown, that still hasn't been really seen in Georgia to this point. Um, other issues that we anticipate seeing are some local control issues that I know the city is always interested in. One of those issues that was uh, debated over the interim was HB 1093 introduced by Representative Dale Washburn, which is a prohibition against certain use restrictions. That bill did not get any traction in committee and then was in, in lieu of a committee vote, he went for a HR 1149 study committee. That study committee met twice, um, two days each, September 28th and 29th, October 12th and 13th. We anticipate a report coming out of that pretty soon, which we'll happily share with all of you. Um, it was called the House Study Committee on Regulation of Affordability and Access to Housing. As always, there'll be some other uh, local control issues that we'll continue to monitor and keep you all abreast of. What, what was the, this, what's, can you dumb that down for me? What what are they trying to do or not do? So this is the issue around essentially um, large hedge fund type industry housing in neighborhoods and communities. They want to do rent to own type uh, yeah. cookie cutter subdivisions. It's, there's no owning. So it's they build a product that looks the same as a product that could be purchased but they, they run them like apartment complexes, but they don't want cities to be able to regulate and inspect like they do apartment complexes. That's, yeah. um, other issues that we kind of anticipate seeing a large, large conversation around is healthcare. Uh, we especially see a conversation continuing around mental health. The uh, Mental Health Reform and Innovation Task Force Com Commission is still going on. And we know that Representative Mary Margaret Oliver and Todd Jones are continuing to examine kind of what needed to be fixed from last year's bill and what else they can do to move forward and further that conversation. Also, there's a task force that the governor put together on healthcare workforce kind of coming out of the pandemic, what that revealed about the healthcare workforce in the state and what kind of changes we could anticipate moving forward into that. Uh, gambling is obviously going to come back again, sports betting and casinos. Um, 
you know, it's our belief that casinos is still not really um, popular, but I think there might be a larger conversation around lottery funding and how that um, sports betting could tie into that. And then lastly, this was really why we put the asterisk next to it, because when we put the presentation together, leadership elections had not occurred. Uh, Speaker Ralston kind of toured the state discussing how nothing was going to be discussed in the House outside of those policies, which would attract younger talent and increase economic development. With the nomination of John Burns, we kind of anticipate that still being the case. Um, so look for moderate policies coming out of the House that are geared towards making Georgia more appealing to corporations and individuals. And then happy to answer any questions before vote on the. Okay. Um, John, any questions? Thank you, Ted, for the uh, briefing. It's uh, interesting that Speaker yeah. Ralston is stepping down or was no longer running for that position again. And his replacement, you think, is a, a moderate, much like himself? The leadership under Speaker Ralston coalesced around uh, then leader John Burns. So he seems to be the quote unquote heir apparent to that type of leadership structure. All right. And as far as the zoning control changes that have popped up in the legislature the last couple of years that have been beaten down and said no to you're still watching that closely it sounds like those are the two bills and the study committee that we need to watch carefully yeah those would probably be the two that i think the city will be that i that we anticipate for sure coming forward that the city would be most inter uh, interested in pursuing. there's a member of the legislature that would put forth bills to take to take uh, funding or take issues off the tax rolls or off the tax bill uh, you know, like let's say sanitation is on there now and other things. Do you know if that is coming back? Do you understand? Do you, do, maybe I'm not explaining it well, but there was I think a, he lost. Maybe that's maybe that's a good thing. All right. Maybe he's gone. All right. All right. So that, that's something that we've been watching in the past. Um, you've mentioned those studies. You mentioned those two bills. Please brief us on those as soon as you can. I'm interested yeah. in those in particular. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Joe. A um, couple of just procedural things, too, that uh, li like to hear about if, look, this is just like wish list things. Um, we got to deal with GDOT, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the authority. How can we effectively deal with it? I know there's a legislative, but right, the GDOT, right? That's so huge with what may or may not happen. Um, I will just keep on saying this until whenever. I'd love to have dedicated state funding for transit. Love for them to expand Medicare without a waiver. Um, yeah, those are those are the. But otherwise, do we have an opportunity? I understand procedurally this is an action item, but then do us. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be hard and fast tonight, up and down. But for us to provide you feedback of things we'd like you to focus on as we coalesce and move forward, um, we have an opportunity to just to go through the mayor. Um, what do you think uh, is a good way to route that through? I, I think if I have a. Oh, there we go. I have a few change. I have a few additions, maybe, and so we may defer. And if people have ideas that we want to include in the resolution, but as things come up or you think of things, we can always reach out to Ted. They communicate a lot during the session with all of us, and so we have a way to give feedback that way. Yeah, I'd like to keep it a little bit un informal. Hey, we work with you. It's a handshake agreement. We're we're writing, et cetera. You know what I mean? So yeah, appreciate that. Stacy. And my apologies if I was thinking about something and, and missed it. What is on the EMS? What? So there was a conversation earlier in the summer, and we'll kind of see how this progresses around possibly zone changing and then wait times around EMS and how 911 operates into this. Uh, we'll see how that has changed now with AMC's closure in Midtown. I think it kind of puts a little bit of a damper on stretching resources further than they were. Um, it's definitely something we're going to monitor for the city as the conversation progresses from where it was this summer. Catherine, anything? Tom? Um, yeah, I just want to clarify one of the uh, priorities listed is the um, supporting uh, removing the school systems from approving applications, it, but it, it mentions um, citizens directing traffic is that related to the speed cameras or is that a different issue it's a different issue in georgia you have to have a yeah that's been on there for a long time is it is the to, speed camera issue still oh yeah no we're no yeah. we need to we haven't really 
They're going to hire a new superintendent, I hear. <laughs> well, no, they have an interim right now. So I hear that they may hire a new superintendent. So um, that's the rumor. Right. So, but we need to focus on that. We need to remove the requirement for the school system to have to approve something on our right away. Correct. Yeah. Ever, maybe this will be the year. And GMA supports that as well. So, and it turns out it's not just like us and Cobb. It's it's not, there's multiple places. Yeah. So potentially maybe. We've had we'll several see. positive conversations okay. over the summer regarding that issue. Yeah. We'll see. And years ago, Vanderlyn was using parents to try to make traffic flow better. And a neighbor complained. And so they had to stop. And then the same neighbor complained about traffic. So go figure. Um, anyway. Okay. Is that, did, what, did you have more? Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Thank so you. So I would like us to add EMS as a priority, Jay. I don't know if you're here. And so I'm. If it's okay, I'd like to bring this back just with, oh, I just pushed a button, Chief. It didn't mean anything. It's okay. Sorry. Excellent. <laughs> I don't know if I pushed it hard enough, but it, I leaned in. Um, there was no reaction. Right. So nothing. So if they come down, right. Um, I think EMS, I don't know if you know this, but EMS is a huge problem for us. And the first thing that needs to happen is the cab needs to be put into two zones or something, we something's will, got to give. We will discuss But if it. you will discuss the language, making it a priority, that would be really helpful. Um, the other thing, question I have is, there was a study committee on development authorities. Have they met? Do you know? I'm not sure, I'll check into that. Okay. But I know they have not filed a report because I was looking at the reports today. Okay. Um, we have in our priorities that we would be open to development authorities that unless there's a partnership assigned agreement that outside development authorities can't make deals in Dunwoody or Brookhaven or whatever, you know, just, yeah. Okay. Um, Basically a municipality that already has a development authority. You don't have another one coming in. Right. And then finally, I don't know how to make this happen politically, but the rules about virtually attending council meetings, for example, are pretty, archaic. Um, I think it's two meetings a year and then you have to have a doctor's letter and but it was probably written in the day of conference calls if I had to bet. And so it I don't think it should be open ended. I don't think you uh, or maybe we should go to local control and let each jurisdiction adopt their own rules. But I don't know if you know working with our legislators if y'all can help draft something or I guess it would be edit what's already out there. Um, or at least begin the discussion with our representatives. Um, again, I'm not asking that, I think it should be a local decision. Mm -hmm. Another one is, um, you know, I, I work in the private sector, I work for Accenture. We would never share publicly our information system security plan. That's right? already been fixed. They fixed that for executive session last session, didn't they? You can do IT problems. Well, no. Cyber security is now uh, permitted under yes. section. Yes, gotcha. Thank you. La uh, Problem solved. Got what you wish for. Um, so, the the I know we'll mostly be playing defense, but um, the the yeah, that's what I have. We can add. We can okay, so if y'all can add those and then just bring it back, that'd be great. Y'all don't have to necessarily come back, but you can if you want. All right. Do you need anything from us? Um, I don't believe so. All right. Well, go ahead, Joe. If I may. Oh, go John. John. Um, I'm always interested in the DeKalb delegation meetings. If you can give us some update, give us some time frame. I work downtown. I'm happy to go and attend and sit along the wall and just, you know, it's the it's a good show. Sometimes I sometimes I enjoy watching the show. So we will um, send yeah, you their, I, their schedule. They set that at the beginning of the session. Please, it would be uh, beneficial to me. Thank you. And I don't think we've done a meal for them in a while. I don't know that we've ever done a meal. No. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay, never mind. Who we want? Joe, go ahead. So, do we move to defer? Yes, we need it as an action item. Thank you. Next table. 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 Move to table. Second. All right. Um, move by Joe. 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 Second by Rob. Um, and on a motion to table, we can't discuss it, right? So, discussion's over. Okay. 
will learn. Any, no discussion. All in favor, say aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay. No op opposition. Thank y'all very much. We'll Thank see you, you during the session. Yep. Okay. All right. Am I? The next three items are all related for the same project, but they're three separate voting items. Um, back in the summer, the city council approved a right-of-way agreement with Brookfield for the Ashford Dunwoody path in front of the mall. Uh, now we're coming back for uh, the funding for construction. Um, the first item is an agree a project agreement with Perimeter CID for the that outlines who's responsible for what and how you know how the costs are divided up. Uh, Ted Reinhardt is here tonight from the CID. This uh, same agreement will be presented to their board this Wednesday uh, for approval. And so um, it outlines both the right of way costs that had previously been agreed to, it documents that in writing, as well as the construction funding. And if you look, the the CID, a lot of the costs are being split 50-50, but the CID is paying um, about 25% more for the right-of-way cost and uh, a, more, a little more than half for the overall construction. And on the construction side, they're, they've agreed to pay for a lot of the aesthetics they, uh, at some of the corners at the intersections where they have their, their rock walls and things. It's, um, they, they've incorporated pavers and some of those decorative elements into the design. Um, so the second item is for to the council to actually fund the author uh, authorize the funding for the construction. It's already been budgeted. We're using one of our on call contractors uh, with their estimate uh, is included in your agenda package, and so that would be to authorize staff to go ahead and allocate and expend that funding for the project. And then the third is for the lighting agreement with Georgia Power. The the light, a lot of the lights that are out there, there are already pedestrian lights out there, but a lot of them are in the way of the project. And so they'll be replaced with newer LED lights um, when the project's completed. And so the there's a request there to approve the funding for the uh, installation cost of uh, 140,769, which would also be split 50 50 with the CID. Okay. If, if it's okay with council, you can probably ask questions on all three at once rather than trying to keep up with which one. I'll start with you, Tom. Any questions, comments? Um, no, no questions, Michael. Thank you. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and I'm, I'm very excited to see this project finally. Moving forward, so uh, thank you for your all your hard work. Uh, appreciate the uh, partnership with the PCID on this uh, to helping to make this reality. So thank you. Go ahead. I, I have just one question on the uh, the lighting agreement. So we're replacing some existing lights with more efficient lights. Is there a net savings for operating costs that we'll get? Is it about the same as before because maybe we have more lights now, or how does it play out? I guess to what we had before. That's that's a good question that I'm going to uh, try to dive into. The, our current bill, you know, there's thousands of street lights across the city. Some of them are broken out and itemized separately. Separately, some of them are lumped together. So I have to try to get into the bill and see uh, if I can isolate those costs or get them from Georgia Power. But um, I, I will look into that. Yeah, that's fine. I, I I just to my mind, it seems like it. The monthly cost may not necessarily be an increase of that amount. It, it might be some other numbers. It should be right. It shouldn't be right. Uh, thank you to Brookfield Properties and David Silver, General Manager of the Mall, and that team, and PCIDs, of course, to make this come to fruition. My question is about the bus shelter. Mm -hmm. What is the plan for that? Is it going to be bigger, artistic? Um, it's what? going to be. Uh, I could probably send you a picture of it. It will be, it will not have advertising on it and it will be uh, in the style of this of the CID standards, which I'm not sure if there are any currently out there on the Dunwoody side, but it will be a uh, nice modern non-ad bus shelter. And I'll, I'll find a picture and send it to y'all. Okay. 
okay, so we won't be deviating from PCID standards just so the whole area is in the same right. configuration. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to see a picture. Thank you. Stacy. So I know we're all excited for this project to come to fruition, but let's define fruition. So assuming it's passed tonight, PCID passes the funding on Wednesday. When am I going to walk on it? <laughs> I knew somebody would ask. I want you to have, so, have no patience for utility relocation either. Well, we don't have a, a lot of that on this project, but so the the reason we're bringing this tonight, even back when we approved the right of way agreement, we knew it would take some time to get that that real estate closing done, and we weren't going to be able to finish before the holiday shopping season. So we'd always we intended to start in January. That's still our intention. And caveat that with we are still waiting on Brookfield to send back the signed agreement that we had agreed to and just found out last week that the point person at Brookfield Corporate is no longer there as of last week. So we're talking to the mall manager and trying to and their attorney to find out where that agreement is. But that that's really the only thing that is could hold us up at this point. Is Kathy still their attorney or they switched yes. attorneys? Okay. Yes, she is. Okay. And she uh, did not, was not aware of this either until we, we heard it. So, Joe, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to ask the timeline. When's the groundbreaking and when's the rim beginning? <laughs> um, you, is it oak tree removal? I noticed that in a, in a sentence embedded in there. Are we going to remove any of those really big, big oaks? A few of them are being removed, but most of them are being saved. There were a few we we really couldn't avoid. Really, yeah. really. Um, and and we've worked with this contractor before, right? Yes. Uh, yes. I've seen them around there, so they're they've got good creds and reliable, and they're they're available to work. They're not going to be delayed. Um, they've got the resources. If we if we say go, they can they can yes. go. Yes. Yeah. Yes, on this. All right. John. No questions. Everything's been asked. Thank you. Asked but not answered. So if you start in January, what? Summer. Summer. Okay. Summer for completion or groundbreaking? It's groundbreaking in January, okay. completion over the summer. All right. So summer of, summer of 2023. Yeah. <laughs> 2023. So, so I have a question. I have a question. The light poles that we're removing, they may not be the most modern and efficient, but could they be reused? Could it save us some money and put them in areas that we desperately need lights? Can you ask? I don't. We can. We can ask. They'll. They'll be. They're green. Well, we could probably get them painted even. But uh, well, they but... don't have to be in perimeter. Right. Oh, but they're green because of perimeter. We could probably right. paint them, or right. we could, if they're on a street with no lights, I'm not sure the color matters. Like it, it's if you're not. And actually green and black match very nicely, but it doesn't matter if they're on a street with no lights or they're not near other light poles, I think. I mean, I don't want them to look bad, right. but please find out. Uh, yeah, I mean, we there may be cases where we could put, you know, one here or there. I don't, you know, reusing them at like on a whole street, I don't think would save us much okay. money because you have to run all the power underground and everything okay. to get to it. But we'll ask. Ask. Right. Yeah. Please. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. So Sharon, I think you have to read each of these. Did you already read the first one? Oh, number eight. You may have. I have not, okay. but I will. Number eight is approval of a project agreement with the Perimeter Community Improvement District for the Ashford Dunwoody Path Phase One construction. Um, this is an action item. Move to approve. Move by Joe. Second. Second by Tom. Any further discussion or questions? I have one really quick question. The money for this from hotel motel tax is this it is this old hotel motel tax money? Yes. Okay, it's that's all what I thought. Okay. Up. I saw seeing this what thought. Okay. Um, any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously. One minute. Right, that's fine. One minute. Number nine is approval of funding authorization for construction of Ashford Dunwoody Commuter Trail Phase One. Okay. Move to approve. Move by Rob. Second. I didn't hear who was Tom. Okay. Tom. There's a lot of action up here that shouldn't be happening. Um, 
All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. And number 10 is approval of lighting agreement with Georgia Power for Ashford Dunwoody Path Phase One Street Lights. Need a motion. Move to approve. Move by Rob. Second. Second by Stacey. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. Aye. Woohoo! That passes unanimously. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, PCID. Thank you, PCID. Okay. The next item is approval of facility usage agreements with the Athletic Association partners. Brent Walker. Evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, as discussed at the last Council meeting, we have uh, seven usage agreements with our athletic associations that provide uh, three provide recreation programs as a recreation program provider, and the other four are school programs that we facilitate at Brookrun Park. Um, the one difference, again, between last year and this year is that we will be increasing the fee for tournaments. Uh, this is to hopefully increase the uh, revenue that we generate off of our fields to go towards the sinking fund that uh, y'all established tonight. Uh, so I'm here to answer any other additional questions you may have. Who needs a motion first? I'd like to make a motion that we remove the DSB usage agreement um, and table it uh, so we can finalize. Don't table it yet, because then we can't yeah. talk about it. Um, okay. Start. Start up. Okay. So make a mo I think we need a motion for the to just remove it or just a mo we need um yeah right you could make a motion to pass and then amend the motion so we are failing parliamentary we are failing let, let me help so <laughs> if there's a package on here yeah. you can do a motion to approve everything but x and table that item for a later meeting as one motion just because we have these new rules we're operating under. If we make a motion, if she makes a motion and uses the word table, that ceases conversation on that item, correct? So if you want to continue the conversation, you can do it multiple ways. The first thing is, like she, I think she started to do, right. was to table a component of that item. Right. And if that's agreed on, then you would have the remaining issues to decide how you want to do a motion. Or you could move to approve all of them and amend it by taking out. I'm a little concerned about that. I'd prefer to do it the other way. Okay. So, but we can have, we're going to have a discussion first. Questions for Brent, starting at John. Anything? Uh, no questions at the moment, but I'm interested to hear what's going on. <laughs> um, Brent, uh, just confirm with me what's in the packet today. Have there been any edits or changes since the last? No. Thank you. Stacy. So one thing that we've always talked about is the fact that we have no mm -hmm. softball fields in the city and that the girls are locked out of our peach tree fields. Um, in kind of brainstorming and thinking of what we can do, I approached some of the softball dads. Um, and so what we would like to do is set aside and do a usage agreement with DHS girls softball or whatever their umbrella is called, their, their nonprofit is called, where they would have one field at Peachtree from 4.30 to 6.30-ish. That, that's one reason the details have been worked out. Monday through Thursday, when, and this is just from October through, or this is from August through mid-October. Um, and then from mid-September on, when the Dunwoody High School girls softball team has a game, they don't have lights. So they have to start at three o'clock in the afternoon to, in order to get it on. So we would then, um, allow them to play their game under lights with bathrooms at uh, the Peachtree Fields. So I'm asking to table the Dunwoody Senior Baseball Usage Agreement so that it can be matched with the usage agreement that will be um, agreed to by uh, softball. Um, again, this is 10 weeks. It gives our Peachtree Middle School girls a field. Um, we have worked through the mound issue. We have money in the ARP recreational equity budget line item to buy equipment that we need. It seems to me like it's a win-win. Um, we're, they are open to it. I know DSB 
has said they understand it and they are not opposed to it is not strongly opposed to it. <laughs> we'll phrase it that way. So I just feel like this gives us time to um, get a usage agreement so that girls softball can be played beginning next August at the Peachtree Fields. Um, we'll come back to that idea. Catherine, you have anything? I'm fine with exploring the idea of girls softball. I definitely think that everybody needs a chance to provide some input. So I, right. I definitely like holding that off if we want to propose that. Um, okay. Um, John. I guess I'm okay with the idea of girls softball. I guess my only question is, is how do we, why are we tabling only the Dunwoody senior baseball? Why aren't we talking to all of our nonprofits that have space available or the, you know, does it have to be at the, at the Dunwoody senior baseball field? It has to be it, a baseball field. It does. Or a softball field. It has to be a diamond. Okay. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm not a softball fan. Practice versus games. I'm trying to understand all the, I want to make sure. Yes, it has to be on a oh. diamond field that is compatible for softball, which would be a baseball field. It's also the Peachtree Group Middle School Girls. So it's their school field as well. well agreed. And that's why I was hoping at some day we would you know, also turf the football field, lacrosse field there. I guess I'm just trying to understand all of the, the dynamics of it. Is there any way to line any other field into a diamond i mean we've been talking about lining fields in the past again i'm not against the discussion i just want to make sure that we're talking to everybody and that we're looking at all options so this is a low-hanging fruit mm. it is it is eight hours a week for 10 weeks and and it is and is our and it is our fields and we can get everybody on the same page and how it can work together with logistics and fences and bases and mounds. So that's what we need the extra time for. I, so I, I think that the challenge is, and for me personally, is, is that we are nowhere close to having a permanent equitable situation. It's not equitable to take a rectangle field. I mean, I'm not a softball parent. My children were not the athletes, except for the ones that rode horses. Um, but I don't think it's equitable to put a diamond in the middle of a football field and then say it's the same. And I'm, I'm not criticizing the idea. I'm just saying that I'm worried that we continue to, we certainly set ourselves up for criticism, right? Because we have a sport that's primarily paid by girls. We have no options for them on in this particular sport. We can talk about rectangular fields for lacrosse and soccer and all that. But this, as I understand it, because I also wasn't a baseball parent. This is not the busy time of year for base that age baseball either. Correct, somebody. It's, That's correct. The spring league is definitely busier. Um, right. We do have a very robust fall program too. But um, in speaking with only senior baseball, they are willing to work with the city to help. Okay. We have other ideas that we're working on and towards, and so I think we view this as a short-term solution, not not a long-term solution because it's still not particularly equitable, but we have to get there. And in the meantime, every season that we're not able to even say, we don't have anything that we could say today that we know we could do in August. We're just not there. Maybe something will pop up, but that's sort of where this genesis of an idea came from as we brainstormed, how do we serve girls who play softball in our community. Um, and I don't think it's gonna cost very much, is it? There will be some costs right. associated with it. Um, the main cost will be relying on the turf field. Uh, we will have to do some base realignments. Um, the bases that are currently at the fields are much longer baselines. Right. Uh, softball is 60 feet. So we will have to potentially put in a new home plate and new baselines and base plugs. Uh, so it won't be as expensive as building a new softball field, certainly, uh, but there will be some costs associated well, with- We were gonna expensive. spend four and a half million dollars to build two softball fields. So are you talking a million to do yeah, this? That's what I'm saying. It, I mean, come, there will be some cost. It won't just be the mound and fencing. Right. We will have to cut the turf and put in new um, build, you know, baselines and, for softball. And will we need to cut it if it was just for practice? I mean, I'm just asking. Yes. Okay. I okay. mean, it, it it is is more important for gameplay because right. it needs to be regulated, especially for safety. Mm -hmm. For practice, I, you know, I've seen 
kids practice softball on football fields with rubber mats right. on bases. So um, it depends on how far we want to modify the facility for the type of use that we might want to offer to the school system. And if we're looking at games, certainly we're going to have to do it to a right. regulated standard uh, for gameplay. Um, and practice. the thought was middle school girls would play their games there. Okay. So. All right. So I don't, I think that for tonight's purposes, what we're asking is, is to pull the DSB agreement so we can at least further analyze this. Go ahead, John. I guess I'm just trying to think of the order in which we rent out our fields. Um, how many different organizations play baseball or play on those fields? I mean, I remember what's the traveling one that we uh, made the an agreement ones. with? Yeah. Oh, it may be L. The men's yeah, the men's traveling. Do they have bumping rights? I mean, they're they're an association that we've approved. Do they have the right to schedule before this organization that that we're thinking about leasing them to? So the right now there's Domini Senior Baseball and MABL are both have usage agreements for that field. And we work with both those organizations once we open up the field for them to go in and put in their schedule. The way it works is we go in and we block out any times that the city needs to hold the fields, for example, for lemonade days, right. we block the fields so that's not used. Or if there's something we want to do on the fields for maintenance or whatever. Um, once we've blocked out those dates in our system, we set a date for the associations to go in and put in their schedules. Once those schedules are in, we approve them and we send them the invoice for that. So it's not only Stunwood Senior Baseball, it's this other organization as well. Yes, and uh, you know, they're the times that softball is looking to use it would not be a time that MABL would be using it. So okay. there's not much of a conflict between girls softball from Peachtree Middle and MABL. I'm just trying to think of the other organizations to make okay. sure there's no other conflicts. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What is going to change of the DSB contract should we figure out softball? So the way we've written our contracts is that we have a, a statement in there and it's in um, section C of the obligations of the city. And basically what we state is the time frame that any organization or association can get on the field. And it's primarily driven by the um, land swap language that we put in the um, purchase and sell the property between us and DeKalb County Schools. Basically, we have access to our field starting at four o'clock Monday through Friday. Uh, and then, of course, Saturdays and Sundays all day. So what it states in our usage agreement is that Domini Senior and MABL can access those fields after 4 p.m. Monday through Friday uh, and can schedule whatever. Um, we did insert the statement that the city will allocate scheduled time and facility based on the greatest programming need. And that's why we don't, they don't just automatically get to put in whatever they want and get it. They submit their schedule request. We approve it after we've blocked anything out. Uh, so what I think um, Councilwoman Harris would like to see is a statement in Domini Senior Baseball that shows that they do not have access to the field from August to mid-October for that specific time frame. And then it would have one specific for that time frame in the softball association's usage agreement. So it basically carves out that time in Domini Senior Baseball. So it depends on how council wants to proceed. And we can leave it as the kind of open statement that we have in our usage agreements where it's, you have access to the fields or you have access to request time after 4 p.m., but your time is not approved until the city has reviewed it and allocated the time, depending on what we think is the greatest programming use, or you put in more specific time blocks of what each organization will have during that time frame. What is your preference for contract language? We'll just need to make sure that, because with the way the fluidity of sports works, there may be times where the softball program plays an away game and they may not be there on a Wednesday or Thursday. So that field, if we lock it in in their usage agreement, we we had, we may need to put a statement into Domini Senior Baseballs that says they don't have these times 
the book in unless it's already approved by the city. So they can request it of us and we can say, yes, softball has an away game or softball is not practicing. Because from what I've heard from the softball program is they need it three to four days a week. They didn't tell me what days. They didn't say we, we practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, play on Thursday. They may practice Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and have a, a home or an away game on Tuesday. So it you just don't know what that actual usage schedule is going to be until the season is mapped out. Um, so I don't want to get into a situation where we have an empty field that can be utilized because we've locked in specific times that I know the organization can't use it during that time. So I would want to make sure that if we caveat a certain amount of time for softball, that there is some way that we can release that field to another to another organization if they're not going to be there using it. So if I might suggest that we're not going to solve this up here tonight and that we let staff continue to hammer away at it um, and work on it so that, because I, I think that there's a lot of moving pieces. I think it would be nice that we understand a little bit about what it's going to cost just sure. so, um, but that, but the rest of them aren't impacted as far as I can tell, but the rest of the user agreements aren't impacted okay. by this solution Not or potential solution. So. Matt, Madam Mayor, can yes. I suggest some, if you decide to take the action okay. that was discussed earlier, it's really a division of three motions a motion to amend item 11 to vote separately on, I think it was done with his senior baseball uh, uh, usage agreement okay. to separate it out from item 11, then a motion to approve, uh, approve or disapprove or do table item 11 with the exception of Dunwoody senior baseball. And then three, a motion to table consideration done with his senior baseball usage agreement. I think you're going to need three motions to carry out what you're trying to do if you're going to divide item 11, unless you only approve the six and don't take up the seven. Is it seven? seven. That's the least complicated I'm sorry. way to I've do I've been over here plotting. <laughs> you could table them all, true. Yeah, you could table them all. I will then make a motion that we approve the facility usage agreements, but that we remove the Dunwoody Senior Baseball Usage Agreement for separate consideration. Second. Okay, any further discussion on this motion as stated? All right, seeing none, I call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. Next, Rob. Uh, now I move. So. <laughs> Um, I you moved, can ask the attorney for guidance. I move to, so I'm going to pause because if I use the word table, then we don't get to discuss the nominee of senior baseball. Well, now that's the only thing on the agenda yeah. item, unless, unless the chair mm -hmm. decides to allow additional comment, if you move the table, it would not be discussed. So I, I do have one more question then before yes. we did. Right, we so, can continue the discussion, I believe. Well, what, but if I move to table. No, don't then move to table. That's the so, end of it. My my question is more scheduling. Um, when does then when senior baseball need to have their usage agreement set? When does if we decide to move forward with the softball, when do they need to have? I mean, what kind of scheduling restrictions are we looking at by looking at this usage agreement separately that might interfere when when they need to schedule and work out? You know, well, we're, we are already scheduling into you know January through uh, I believe it's March. April of next year already. But this um, goes into effect in August, correct? The, so the, the, the softball, softball right. we wouldn't okay. need to worry about that until August. Okay. But just uh, making as sure. far as not approving Dunwoody Seniors, it would need to be approved before the end of this year. Um, okay. So my goal would be to have something back to you guys by the December 12th meeting. Yeah, that's, that's. I just want to make sure that's exactly the question. I wanted to make sure we're not messing up Dunwoody Senior Baseball now. <laughs> by looking at something for the fall. So I appreciate that, thank you. So then I will move to table the Dunwoody Senior Baseball Usage Agreement pending um, further discussion uh, about usage of the fields for softball. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that carries, thank you. Brent. Is there a motion to, to 
to approve the other six. We, we did. Wait. Did. Okay. <laughs> wait, did we? I don't know that you did. Wait, was that what you did or you just removed it? Motion Okay. 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 Except that I okay. removed that we right. consider that one separately. That's correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's all right. Council, if you will humor me, because I don't know how long 12 is going to take. Can we move 13 up before 12? Do we need a motion to do that or I can just do it? I need a motion. Okay. Madam just because Mayor, they're, uh huh. Sorry, point of order. I don't believe you've voted on those other two motions. Wait a minute. I thought they were un unanimous. We voted. You did vote. I missed it somehow. On both of them, you voted. Yes, we voted. Rob, right. Rob, Rob moved. Right. right. You want to do it more time? Okay. Come back. But Rob, Rob, the first motion again. My, my first motion was that we um, remove the Dunwoody Senior Baseball Usage Agreement from the usage agreements and approve the remaining usage agreements. Okay. And Stacy seconded it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, second motion. The second motion was to table the Dunwoody Senior Baseball Usage Agreement pending discussion with um, a softball organization um, to determine usage of one of the fields. Stacy, you just say. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes unanimously. All right, so now could someone please make a motion to move 13 up for, for 12 so that the people from the YMCA who've been sitting here can leave? because I don't know how long the technology one's going to take. Uh, I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda to move item number 13 to before item number 12. Thank you. Second. Moved by Tom, second by John. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. That uh, passes unanimously. I just want to make sure you don't want to table the item now. No. Okay. <laughs> no, this is an easy one. Get. So we can okay. talk about anyway, it. We have right. gone through uh, the second round of ARP grant applications. And what you have before you is just like the previous time, you're going to approve entities. We're going to negotiate with them as if they're like vendors with us and then work on the grants afterwards. And with tonight's item, you actually have uh, four new agencies and two previous agencies, Community as Assistance Center and Corners Outreach were under the CARES grant before. And you have four new entities, the Adult Day of Dunwoody Foundation, Clubhouse um, uh, Manuel, uh, excuse me, Clubhouse Atlanta, Temple Emmanuel for Backpack Buddies, and that's it. Oh, and the YMCA, <laughs> the Coward YMCA. So um, with this, we'll start the ball rolling immediately tomorrow on negotiations with them. I am not sure if we can bring you the items to approve at the next December meeting, but we're going to try to if we can. Oh, this is an action item. It is, but you have to approve the contract. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, this is an action item. Move to approve. Second. Does, any, uh, I'm, does anybody have discussion or questions? Yes, Stacey, Catherine, sorry. Backpack Buddies is being funded through JFCS and through- Two different Backpack Temple Buddy entities. Think of, think of them, I like to call them franchises in my head. So two different groups that are running at different schools. Uh, Backpack Buddies is a 501c3 located in Dunwoody. Is there no reason we are funding, aren't funding them directly? Uh, yes, because we put stipulations on, they had to have financial statements for an audit. And so they are working through uh, secondary entities working as financially responsible parties. Thank you. John. Um, thank you, Jay. Can you tell us about the funding mechanism in the sense of proving expenses and the clawback monies? Do we give them cash up front? I guess explain to me how that's going to work for, I guess we haven't seen their applications yet, but I yep. want to make sure that that's part of the, the in, discussion. In all of the cases, we it, we are doing a little bit different from CARES in that we're actually fronting a little of the money because cash flow became a problem with CARES. However, what we're doing is putting in very strenuous quarterly reporting marks and since they only get a fraction of their funding, they have to prove to us what they've spent it on before there is any more. So it's kind of a carrot reward program on it. All right. And those metrics will be part of uh, council approval. Uh, what we plan to do is the ones that finish December 31st, because they're so late, we don't plan to do nothing um, much with that. But with the first quarter for next year, y'all will receive, here's what they've done. Here's what they've spent. Thank you. And, and I've, I think I'm, John asked the question I was asking. He asked the financial side and the programmatic side, we will, he probably asked too, we'll receive reports on that as well. So like I read the YMCA application, we're going to see how many children that underserved children they teach to swim. It's, 
we, yeah. we plan to even in some cases, um, when you approved the contract mm -hmm. last time, the scope of services right. was with them. We're, you've also allowed staff to work one-on-one -on -one yeah. in case it needs to be no. tweaked, but that will come back to you. And I plan to have them do it in some type of formal reporting form yes. for easier to read. Yes, that would be awesome. All right. Um, we have a motion on the floor. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right now we have to go back to the... Right, now you can go home. <laughs> now we're back to 12. This is adoption of the technology policy. Ginger LePage. Hello. Um, so this is an action item tonight for the adoption of the attached technology policy for the city of Dunwoody effective immediately. Um, this technology policy would cover all major areas of the technical environment. It can be used as a stepping stone towards accreditation. Um, this version does include one update to page 18, section 1B. We removed um, the phrasing city staff only, and it just says cell phones now. And that's per um, Mr. Bernard's suggestion at the last meeting. Um, this IT policy is recommended by the city's insurance provider, legal team, and the technology department. It was drafted to protect the organization, the employees, and anyone that uses technology from, of, by, with the city. Um, it addresses forensic insurance and open records requirements. It was created using best practice and industry standards. And the training has been created for employees and department heads. It's ready to roll out as soon as the policy is approved. And um, there is individual training for council and how you use the technology that's in the preparation phases as we speak. So if you have any questions. Oh, and the request about no before reports, I have all of your no before reports ready to send to you guys as soon as uh, we can get them to you. Yeah, I'm a pretty bad manager with that stuff. <laughs> Just ignore the emails. Um, questions, starting with Tom, anybody? Okay. Just the observation that I will need to switch my text over to my city phone, um, and that may not occur today, but I'll do this as quickly as I can. Perhaps Mr. Bernard can explain how this is reads differently, because I'm still reading it the same, even if you change the subtitle. I don't have it in front of me, but the change that I mentioned to Ginger was it applies to everybody. To say only city staff would be incorrect if you're using, whether it's council a contracted employee or employee doesn't matter. So I made it applicable or I've suggested making it applicable to everybody uh, based on the read that you have. So essentially that section somehow only applied to staff and it really applies to everybody. Catherine, what page is it on? This is 18 of it, the policy. Is that Ginger, is that the change? It's page 18, section 1B specifically. Right, and I think council had Councilman Hennigan brought up last time the problem is we're still going to have that our constituents have our private numbers and we'll be called on those numbers. And I recognize that this is just a policy, but we're going to be in a between a rock and a hard place on this one is what I think. So, so let, let me uh, try to address that question, because as I said before, it is going to require a change of behavior. But Eric and Ginger and I and others met and what I suggested, and I think Ginger's agreed to do it is. I'm not a technology guru. I think there's a couple or maybe all of y'all know more about technology than I do. I know my battery's about to die, but um, I suggested individual training to talk about the apps, the context, the what's this and what's that. But whether you have this policy or not, your stuff's available in the open record. This actually protects you, believe it or not. But it also protects the city from forensic. We had a forensic issue come up, and this was highly suggested. We had our carrier say, y'all need this. And so I do know that it's not going to be perfect initially because there's going to be a transition time. Ginger and her staff have agreed to meet individually with each of you to see how y'all integrate, interface your technology, what you use at home, what you use if you got three phones or two or however. But I think uh Mr. Hennigan and Mr. Seconder were showing me apps. Unfortunately, I can't answer that because I'm just not smart enough. Right. But I think Ginger can address it. And we we understand there's going to take a minute 
but whether you pass this policy or not, it's the law for the most part. Most of what in here is, is to protect you. The rest of it is to protect the city from liability and hacks and forensic issues. Uh, and I will tell you, when you have this policy, forget about the awards that technology is going to get. It probably will affect your insurance rates on cyber issues and related matters to the positive, meaning it'll be, you. by having the policy in place, you're probably going to save money in the long run. We do recognize the value of the policy. Yeah. Thank you. Stacey, anybody, Joe, John? Yeah, I'm going to approve, I'll vote for this. The problem is, is that uh, any user that has a city issued mobile phone, that's now me, should never use their personal phone for business, text, email, phone calls. Somebody's going to call me and I'm not going to know who the hell it is. I'm going to answer it. They're going to talk city business. Excuse me, please call my other phone that I got somewhere else. I mean, it's just, it's, I'm saying I'm never going to do something when I'm not sure I'm never going to do something. I mean, I don't like lying and passing laws that really doesn't make sense to me to a certain extent. Somebody's going to call me. I wonder if, because I, because I had that experience with the text recently in four hours of my life, I'm never getting back. And it could have been a lot worse if they'd asked for more. I wonder if the way to, and in my head, I have a strategy, like I'm going to send out my new contact information on the phone that sits in its box and dies because I haven't done anything with it. And then I charge it and re rinse and repeat. But the I wonder if the way to handle it is when you get those phone calls is to say, give me a minute, I'll call you back from a new number. I mean, it's painful, but I don't know. But I, I'm going to say something that sounds crazy because I tell my wife this all the time and I'm tied to a phone. I get it. I get 500 emails a day. I can't, sometimes I can't shower in the morning because the phone's ringing off the hook. But the way to address it initially is don't answer the phone, leave a message. If it's city business, you need to call this number. And then you don't have to do anything. Uh, if it's a text, text from the city issued phone, if it's about whatever. I'm not saying that's very practical, uh, Councilman Henry. I, I, I understand the dilemma, especially somebody that's savvy like you and I'm not, but you're going to have to change the beh your behavior if you approve this. You probably have to change it anyway as best practices, but you're going to have to change the behavior that people have access to your number, and that takes a minute, and there are probably ways to do that through messaging, through voicemail, but if you pick up the phone every single time, you're going to run into the dilemma, so I'm not saying that that's a perfect solution, sir. I, I get it completely. Again, I, I want to comply. I try to do the best I can on open records. I, I copy myself into emails. When somebody were to send me something on a personal account, I will send it to myself. I will send it to council, but yet I'm part of council. So therefore I'm sending it to myself. So if you want to do an open records, it's there. But I still think they could yeah. ask like for Facebook Messenger. Like I, I don't. Again, there's, there's, there's so many different technical issues when it comes to social media and all the rest. It's. I'm going to vote to say yes to this. I'm going to, I'm going to try real hard, but that being said, I think there's some flaws for us. If I was a new council member having a new phone and you never had mine, it gets easier as it goes on. So maybe I'm approving this not only for myself, but for the next council member that replaces me. So thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Ron. So I, I think maybe something that might help when we get our training is information perhaps on how to capture and record stuff that comes to our personal phone because if i don't answer the phone and somebody leaves me a voicemail that voicemail is now a record hey there's a real problem with x i need to talk to you if someone sends me a text and i respond to the text on a different phone they have still texted my personal phone i need to at least do a screen capture and save that so i think that kind of information i think will go a long way with how do we handle stuff that comes to our personal phone you know, we, the stuff we initiate, we can do from our city phones, but the stuff that comes into personal phones, how do we make sure we've captured that record adequately and saved it on city servers so that if someone does do a records request, oh, the personal phone was called, this voicemail was left on this date, for example. Ultimately, I think with this policy, and I, I, hear, I hear the concerns, trust me, I, I get it completely. 
I think ultimately what we want to do is move, remove the councilmen, the councilwomen, the employees from making decisions about what's on their phone, whether it's public or private. In the long run, that will happen over a period of time. Judge, here's my phone. If it's government, here's my phone. Not <clears throat> Mr. Councilman Price, you decide what's public and what's not if we didn't capture it. So we're trying to move to a system where we separate, we bifurcate you, unfortunately. Initially, it will be a headache. Uh, there will be problems. And look, you always can revisit by amendment later as this thing plays itself out. We may learn stuff we don't know. That's why I suggested individual training because some of it depends on how you use the technology. Uh, and I think Ginger and them are willing to address those concerns. But if we see a recurring problem, we'll try to address it as we, we go on. I'm not saying this is a panacea of perfection, but I will say it's been over, it's been vetted hard by legal, forensic people, the insurance people and Ginger and her team. And it's the best of an imperfect world right now that we have. I well, I, I think we all agree that we need a technology policy. I think the issue we're struggling with is to make sure that we also comply with open records requirements that come in outside of our government issued devices. And I don't think any of us have a problem doing that. We just want to make sure that that's somehow folded in. So we can work on a standardization of that and and kind of teach that with the when we're doing the policy training. We can make sure that there's something that we're suggesting. I mean, it'd be, you know, standardization suggestions in the interim until you get moved over to your business phone fully. That's so the just for you to understand, that's never happening for those of us who have used our personal number for say 11 years. It's yeah. never happening yeah. ever because unless I say to them, and I might decide to, you have to text this to me. Like I Facebook Messenger for my mayor's account, it says, if you Facebook message me, it tells you how to email me. You don't, it, it, it says, I don't answer here, email me. And so on my Messenger page, my personal Facebook Messenger doesn't give me that option. But but my point is, is it is that unless we go hardcore and don't answer our phone. And we have friends who call us about city things and text us about city things as well as strangers. This is very challenging. And so I think that the policy you come up with is going to have to last forever. And when you run for office, you use a phone number, probably your home, your personal phone number, and then you become elected. And a lot of people have that number, even if you get a city number. So just think about that as you're developing the policy. And this is an action item. Any other for the questions? Go ahead, John. Just one final thing. I keep reading this over. Ginger, explain to me, what if I turn in my city cell phone? How does this affect me then at that point? But have you looked at the policy on compliance if we were to turn in our city phone? What happens then? I don't need to comply with this section. So you're saying that if you went to using only your personal phone? You're right. So you'd still be required by the Open Records Act, which I would, I would prefer if Sharon or Ken answered it because it is more of a legal versus a technology policy issue at that point. But at that point, you're still required to abide by the Open Records Act. Even right. If I, I, I'm just trying to I'm trying to understand the ins and outs of reading the policy, but yet looking at the unintended consequence, not myself, but somebody might turn in their cell phone. What happens next? How does that how does this policy affect that decision? I guess I'm just trying to think it through. Well, if you use no city technology at all, then you can't violate the policy, but you still are subject. Remember, you, you've got an oath of office. Right. You got the ethics uh, issue. You've got a policy in place that you can't circumvent indirectly, and you got state laws to fall back. We we want to remove. I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear. Okay. As an elected person, you're never a private person, 24 seven. That's just the way it is. It, it's it's a challenge for people to run for office. It's a challenge for them to be in office, but the law doesn't distinguish you as John, the private person. You're a city councilman 24 mm seven. -hmm. And so anything you do related to city business, you're subject to the Open Records Act, whether you're using city technology or not. Right. 
what I don't want to do or what I would love to do for, for y'all eventually is be in this position where we're not caught because the data, there, there's a way forensically to get everything off your personal phone with the mm -hmm. courts involved and AT&T and T-Mobility and all these other places. We don't want to put you in a position where you accidentally didn't think something was public. Right. It got found out through a, th a third way, and there's ways to do it when it's in the court, and then you committed a crime. Right. I get it. Which I understand. That's I'm, just, I'm not just looking yeah. at it from every option. I'm not sure the technology policy forces me to own the city. You no, know, you don't have to have any technology. You can shut it all down and not have any, but your private computer that's used for public purposes the contents on it may create a public record subject to disclosure. And we don't want you deciding for your own sake. I don't care if you decide, but we'd like to remove you from the equation where you have public stuff and there's no mixing of the two because a judge one day might sort that out in a way that is not good for you. And that's what we're concerned about. We're protecting you from yourself, trying to anyway. You're like my wife. Thank you. All right. This is an action item. Have we had a motion yet? Move to approve. Move by Tom. Second. Second by Catherine. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Me too. Um, that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Bring the next item is an ordinance to amend chapter four alcoholic beverages of the city of Dunwoody code of ordinances to amend alcohol licensing requirements for businesses and other purposes. Good evening, mayor. Good evening, council. Mm -hmm. um, this item is coming back to you. It was before you all sort of as a conceptual discussion item. Then in October was before you all as a discussion item, and now it's coming back as a sort of formal text amendment as, as an action item. And as the first read today, um, I'll give an abbreviated version of uh, this presentation that I've given before. Um, and I'll focus on the, the slight changes that we made uh, since, uh, since I've presented this to you, to you all. Um, this is regarding the um, alcohol requirements specifically for spirits, so for, for liquor-based drinks uh, that right now require a full-service kitchen and food sales of a minimum of 60%, so 60% food sales, 40% alcohol sales of the total sales. Um, we're bringing this because we've, we've, re we've, we've received sort of requests from a variety of businesses that wanted to operate in the city of Dunwoody, so as it's partially an economic development um, item and it's partially sort of providing uh, amenities to our residents. And uh, first change here, I'll go over the changes individually, um, again, with a focus on the, the changes since uh, the last meeting. Uh, we're proposing to change the 60-40 split for restaurants, for eating establishment to a 50-50 split which is in line with the majority of our neighboring communities. Um, we are creating for the uh, alcohol ordinance, we're creating two new use categories. Uh, one is personal improvement services. That is your barber, that is a uh, fitness studio, and that's type of services of, of that nature. And the second is entertainment and spectator sports. And that is, that could be a concert venue, that could be a mini golf venue, uh, that could be uh, something like that. And currently, these type of businesses can serve alcohol, but no liquor. And this would allow them to do this uh, because this is a new proposal for Dunwoody. We're proposing several safeguards. One is there is still um, a primary purpose required. The sales there are at least 50%. So if I'm, like in the example uh, the gentleman gave at the last meeting, if I'm a barber that wants to participate in this, um, I would have to have 50% of my sales from um, from haircutting in, in addition to the alcohol sales. Um, we have an earlier closing time of midnight. And again, those are 
the, the requirements to make sure that this does not become sort of a nightlife destination per se, that this does not become bars, that this does not become um, a potential nuisance. Then based on council comments, we had to propose this at the last meeting that both of these new categories would have to be in entertainment districts in the city. We're now proposing that the entertainment and spectator sports, because it's potentially the one that could come with more negative externalities uh, for that to be started out in the entertainment districts um, for the personal improvement services that are a bit safer in, in that sense for those to be uh, citywide. And then the last safeguard that we have in there is that it was specifically excluding specific uh, potentially problematic uses, uh, uses and that examples are uh, massage businesses um, and the adult uses. For all of those, because we had some discussion around the specific definitions of these categories, um, what we've done is we've uh, sort of copy pasted the definitions from the zoning ordinance, which um, is essential for us because we approve sort of every single business for the business license. And we approve these based on the zoning ordinance to make sure that they can legally operate in uh, in that specific zoning district and it makes it easy if all of these things line up and it makes it hard if these things do not line up well if something is a personal improvement service over here it ideally is the same thing over in in this other ordinance and it's complicated if these things conflict so what we're proposing is to use the same language as in the zoning ordinance and um, then one thing that is uh, a change compared to the discussion item in October is that we're not proposing to change the regulations for hotels anymore. Um, if you all remember, there was conversation around uh, what's a nightclub, what's sort of this type of dancing that is, you know, on, on this side of the line, what's that type of dancing that is on, on, that, on that side of the line. We do not think that hotels are like our current sort of main problem and then the focus of this so we're proposing to take it out and then see if it becomes something that we want to uh, tackle in uh, in six months or a year then we can bring it back and then at the last meeting I did not have maps for the entertainment districts and again this is for entertainment and spectator sports we have two entertainment districts in the city and this is just a reminder on the left hand side you see the Dunwoody village district on the right hand side the perimeter center district and with this, I'll conclude uh, the presentation and I'm ready for any questions you may have. John, do you have any questions before you leave? Okay. Um, Tom, anything? Um, yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, as I stated last time, I'm, I'm generally in favor of this, this ordinance. Um, I think it's a good thing. Um, could you give a little more explanation on the the what was it? The sport, the entertainment and spectator sports. Spectator sport. it, it seems like we're making it unnecessarily complicated to allow one anywhere and one only in entertainment districts. I may be missing something, but I don't necessarily see a concern with allowing that anywhere. So I guess I just, I just want a little bit more explanation on the justification of kind of separating those classifications. Yeah, where, where we initially came from is to have a conservative approach to this, to uh, have to rather err on the side of having more safeguards um, than, than the other way around. Um, generally, um, the Moody Village and Perimeter Center are the places in the city that have relatively robust police presence um, at, at night. And those are the places where we have a bit more concentrated uh, type nightlife uh, uses currently. So we propose to group these items in into those districts whether that sort of is, you know, if we want to go with a bit less conservative approach, we can certainly take this out as well. I guess safer to start conservative if, if, if the issue came up and a business wanted to go in an area that's not permittable by the, uh, the proposed ordinance, we could always address it at that time. Um, okay, that's... Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not, I'm not really sure. I mean, I I would hate to open up a uh, a can of worms that 
with unintended consequences. So perhaps a, the more conservative route at this point is safer because we could always amend it later. But first, I, but I'm I'm also not seeing a major problem. So, but I guess I'll for now I'll leave it as is. Rob, I think I'm kind of a, the same mindset as you. Is I don't know that we need to keep it to the entertainment districts, but I can appreciate starting carefully. I think I'd rather just see is there at some time where we we will intentionally revisit this so that if somebody say is thinking about doing something in Georgetown they don't have to wait for an ordinance change if after 18 months of this being in place we see hey it's working out really well let's bring it out citywide so I think that's just kind of a a big picture preference I'm sharing is that rather than wait for someone to come let's revisit this at some predetermined time after this is implemented um, to decide if it's worthwhile citywide. Stacy, I hear what you guys are saying that I read the last paragraph with the calls to police department related to alcohol businesses with the public indecency, da, da, da. So I was like, okay, so I can see now why a little bit more conservative approach, like let's give it a go. But I also really like your idea of let's revisit it automatically in 18 months or a certain time frame. Just, I, yeah, great points. Go ahead. Okay, so I have a couple things just so I make sure I understand. So right now, under this ordinance, if somebody just sells beer and wine and they're not in one of the two entertainment districts, what does this mean for them? Do they still so, have to meet the 60-40? So this just adds more options in, in that sense. So no. if anyone can choose to do the things that are currently, none of those will be precluded. So if someone sells just beer and wine, yes. they can continue to do that. They can continue to do it at but 2 a.m. Does the... Does the formula change for them if they're just beer and wine? Or... It, 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 it does not. If they want to maintain sort of the, the option they have currently, they can continue to do that. Okay, so if they're, I'm trying to make sure we're not compete, creating a competitive edge. That's what I'm trying to do. And I've had lots of concerns about this, so I understand if you want to whatever. But if I own a restaurant that serves alcohol in Georgetown, Am I and we pass this for the entertainment district? Am I now, as a business owner in Georgetown, less competitive than the businesses in Perimeter? You know, for for the restaurants, all of uh, the the reporting requirement changes from sixty forty to fifty fifty throughout the city. So no right. change yeah, for, that changes for everybody. This yeah. has to do with if you're going to do putt putt with alcohol. Right. right now, you have to do it in one of the, under this ordinance, you'll do it in one of the entertainment districts. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Okay. All right, this is a first read. Anybody have anything else? Thank you. We're getting there. Next. Yeah. <laughs> While he's walking up here, would anyone like to make a motion? But we have to let Carl show his right. pictures. We always like the pictures of... See, I, I wasn't even going to pull the pictures up this time. If you want to see, I, I, I can pull them up. We don't get a ball. You don't really have to. No, I know. you really don't have to. In the meantime, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, Stacy, um, Catherine does. Yeah. Um, do, do you want Councilman Lautenbacher to go ahead and ask her question? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so real briefly, um, this is a request for approval of a uh, funding authorization, authorization of uh, storm repairs at 5252 Trowbridge Drive. Um, 
I'll go through it real brief. Um, the project will consist of um, repairs to 122 feet of 18 and 36 inch corrugated metal pipe, approximately the age is 47 years old. And um, the repairs will consist of um, 20 feet, uh, 20 foot um, deformed section that's separated. We're gonna dig that out and the rest will consist of curing in place uh, trenchless repair lining and uh, replacement of a 36 inch brick head wall. Um, the funding um, request is for $84,248.36. And if approved by council, the funding will be um, drawn from the American Rescue Plan budget allocated for storm improvement projects. And mm -hmm. I will open it up for questions. Anybody have questions, Catherine? Yes. Since you've given us the date at which the sinkhole was reported, we're now looking at a two-year lag between reporting and repairing. Can you explain that? Absolutely. Um, just to um, give you uh, just a, a brief background on the condition of the infrastructure in the city, approximate age is actually about the age of this infrastructure. Um, it's around 47 years old. Um, a lot of the uh, pipe infrastructure in the city that is corrugated metal pipe is in similar condition. Um, I did a brief um, query in our GIS database and we have approximately right about 500 that are just in the right of way alone in marginal or worse condition. A lot of that infrastructure we're gonna knock out using the ARPA money, but um, these particular jobs where they're off of the right of way and they're just impacting a few property owners, we rate those projects and because of the, because they're not in the right of way and they're not impacting the whole public that are commuting down these roads, they're rated lower and they take a little bit longer to address. So the scoring on those projects, the longer they sit in the queue, the, the score of it is, is raised. So this particular project is closer to the top now because it's sat in the queue for a long time. Is the property owner advised of the timeline? Um, I have not, I, I try not to commit to any specific timeline because a lot of the projects are dependent on contractor availability, but um, I've been in communication with the homeowners and just let them know, you know, what was going on. They, we, well, they would know it'd be a while. Yes, yes, yes. So that cone on top of a piece of plywood doesn't look like it's a safe Interim fix? Well, in, in, in most instances, what we typically do is we send our maintenance crews out there to stabilize the area, flow the field, um, patch the area as best best we can until we can go with a more permanent repair. So that's that's our typical procedure. So in that particular case, we would go in there and we would patch the whole, patch that pipe as best we can. But in that particular instance, it was so far up the line and because the pipe was separated, if we just pour flow the field in the hole, it would just basically create a blockage and it would create an even bigger issue. So that's the reason why we left that particular issue as is, so to speak. It just seems like a small child or deer hazard and right, know, right, that kind right, of thing. Right, right, right. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's definitely one of those situations saying. where, you know, particularly in the, in the pipe infrastructure that's off the right of way, in most instances, we can come up with a you know a temporary fix but like I said because it was a separation we didn't just want to pour flow but fill in it and create a bigger issue backing up the water into the road okay thank you mm -hmm. any move to approve second thank you so much Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm always last. <laughs> I'm yeah. Stuart Strong again. So uh, tonight I am to discuss with here before you a to close out caps a couple of capital projects and reallocate funding. So within the uh, memo for the agenda item, our first within our capital projects fund, fund 350, mm -hmm. we're closing out two projects and reallocating those funds to the two additional projects listed there within that exhibit. Within the SPLOST fund, we are closing out a couple of projects and using the uh, uncommitted SPLOST dollars that we had uh, um, allocated at um, the mid-year budget amendment that we did. 
and we are funding, and I, again, won't read through all the projects, but we're funding the projects identified on that list. So with that, we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. So like old village run sidewalk, wasn't that done a while ago? Yeah, and I knew, you, I was hoping Michael would be here. I believe that's I to, um, I believe we went over budget slightly. So okay, that's fine. Money just moving that money. To, okay, that's uh, fine. That's fine. I was just curious. An overrun to true up the budget to actuals. That's good. Um, any, yeah, this is a not a business item. Any further discussions? Go ahead, Joe. Net gain or loss. Obviously, negatives are in parentheses. Pluses are not, right? Correct. So, um, I'm just like, what's the net effect for these changes? Are we a plus or minus? Do we have surplus, excess? Just what? What is that? So the general? net effect is zero to to both of them. Oh. We are allocating. Uh, the plus and the minus is equal zero. It's been too late. All right. The left side and right side, left side and right side entries have to have to foot. Right. Okay. Anybody else? This is, uh, can we put this on consent for the next meeting? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Public comment. There's zero public left. Um, Eric. Man, we do it in an executive session um, for litigation. And actually, according to the city attorney, we can actually hold that in here. We can, we can turn the camera, go go dark on the camera. Mm -hmm. I think we can hold that in here. So there's nobody screen. Just to, if it's in the interest of time, this can be short. Okay. So, turn off everything. Okay. Well, right. They'll do that when we get, maybe. Better. All right. We're not there yet. We have uh, council comments. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I just have one uh one additional comment. Um, and that is the uh the I just wanted to provide everyone a really brief update on the citizen advisory uh capital improvements committee. Um that ad hoc committee uh began meeting in September. Uh citizen uh committee uh met we had five meetings between uh then and now. There was one additional meeting scheduled if needed, uh, but the committee concluded its work so uh we will be presenting a report to council at a future meeting uh council meeting uh updating you on the recommendations of that committee when i say completed there is a little asterisk there uh, because the uh, committee elected to table discussion on trail projects until after the PATH Foundation has completed the master trail plan they just didn't believe they had enough information to effectively rank those projects. So that portion of the um, recommendations will be on hold, but the remainder uh, is complete and look forward to presenting it to you. Rob, you have anything? Nothing, but thank you for the update on the capital projects. Catherine. I regret that I did not go earlier in the public comments when Tom did because I'm going to address the mission as it came up in public comment and Councilman Hennigan has brought it up twice. So let me say this. The mission is what we do and the values are how we do it. The values that are in place for this city were written by Danny Ross and in place since 2008. I will read you the highlights. We will be ethical, professional, service oriented, fiscally responsible and transparent, organized, communicative, collaborative, and progressive. I want to assure and reassure the citizenry that we continue to operate under these values as we have since inception. Thank you. Stacey, anything? Joe, anything? Well, just on a nice note, I had friends visiting here from Walnut Creek, California, and it's like a 180 because back when I was an advocate, I put a post on Hennigan's blog in 2010, could we have multi-use paths? And it's a picture of him and his wife walking there. Fast forward, I'm here walking through the, on Wednesday through Brook Run. Now, I spent like two hours showing them everything in the history of, oh, by the way, and did you know about this and do you know about that? They were blown away and impressed. Absolutely every little thing, right? Then I took them to the rooftop bar. Ooh, ah. And they saw the skyline of downtown Dunwoody. They said, where's downtown? So it's like about village. No, this is your downtown right here. Wow, look at that. And then we had 
sorry, I've had Nova Kachina. They were blown away again. These are high end people. They've got like a, you know, so anyway, it's just, I'm just saying, right? The glasses have felt be grateful, gratitude, thankful in life, you know? So there you go. Thank you. I see. Move to go. Oh, no, you're going to comment. I, no, I have no, I don't think I have a comment. Okay, I well, can't that's... solve the deer problem very easily. No. Just I say move to exit to executive session for purposes of um, litigation. litigation. Second. All right. So. There's other ca there's other cameras. We purchased other cameras. Yeah, right.
we got home, our plane was late. We had like 11.30 and it was like one o'clock before I could be able to go upstairs. <laughs> Move to adjourn. <laughs>